brief from this plane, two veteran pilots, uh, CNN aviation analyst Les Aben from uh, Iowa, if I'm right about that, in the, uh, no, Connecticut, yeah, right next to Iowa. Okay, veteran like Veteran aviation call. correspondent Bob Arnett. Uh, Bob, let me start with you here. Talk to me about the debris itself. We understand okay, the largest piece, about 79 feet long. Anything about this debris that gives you reason to believe that it could be from the plane or might not be? So sure, it really depends how the plane entered the water. Can we uh, get Egypt, can we get that turned off? off? I don't know if it's in the audience or and you remember where it's, it's very at. Small because it hit with such speed. Air France was basically stalled into the ocean, so you had a much bigger piece. Remember that famous tail that came up, and then of course when Sullenberger landed uh, his Airbus there. Turn my sound off. Commissioner Rodriguez. Here. Commissioner Onstad. Here. Commissioner Wessner. Present. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is a, the point in the proceedings where we hear public comments from anybody in the audience on any issue that's not on the agenda today. Are there any speakers uh, under that topic or lack of topic? Okay. Moving on to item 5, PL13-0011. Um, a couple of things I'd like to say before we get going. Um, procedurally, um, this, is a, this is a meeting room, a boardroom. Uh, I would ask that everyone maintain the decorum in here and hold the comments down in the audience or, or the emotional responses that occasionally happen. Secondarily, uh, there's no food or coffee in this boardroom, so please refrain from doing that. Uh, do that outside um, in the appropriate area. And thirdly, um, depending on how long we go, those of you that are parked immediately be behind us here are in a, re a limited parking area, and uh, we'll make note of that probably uh, at the break. But those of you that are out there in that area would probably be wise to move your vehicles, otherwise uh, have a citation waiting for you when you come out. So with that, I'd like to uh, reopen the public hearing that we uh, and continue with the meeting of uh, February 13th. Um, and we were in the public comments section. And somewhere up here, I've got cards here, there. What I'd like to do is call the people that didn't get a chance to speak last time. Um, and if they're here, if they would please come up. Obviously, if they're not here, they won't answer. And then uh, we have some additional cards uh, that came in, speaker cards that came in today. Those will be uh, subsequent to these. Um, There is, uh, there will be additional comment. Uh, ultimately, uh, the, the applicant would be given the opportunity to respond uh, in rebuttal, um, and the committee will, will close a public hearing. The commission will close a public hearing. We will go through into discussion and, uh, and then make a determination. I would ask that we keep the comments on topic. I realize there's a lot of issues involved, uh, side issues involved that keep popping up in these various documents. I would ask you to refrain from presenting other scenarios that have some bias or some potential cause for a person's position one way or the other on this issue. Uh, with that, I will uh, call the first speaker, uh, Tom uh, Balanex, Balant Balantine, excuse me. Tom Ballantine here, Hen Henry Benna, Gerald 
Benecki. I'm sorry. Come forward. Um, if you would introduce yourself and uh, give us your address, please. Um, Tom Ballantyne. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to offer my time for another speaker. So I'm, I'm fine. Because what I had to say last time was, was pretty much covered at the last. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. All right, you're welcome. Henry Benna. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. I uh, just want to know that if the... Would you tell us, uh, give us your address for the record, please? Oh, Henry Bita, 9910 Houston Road, Malibu, one, in, one mile and a quarter from uh, where all this is going to be happening. Okay. I hope not. I uh, just wondered if uh, the people that bought that property ever uh, asked the neighbors whether they would object to having tigers next door to them. And uh, that's up, and, and the rest of the neighbors. And that's about all I have. Just have that question asked, which was never done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gerald uh, Benecke. My name is Gerald Benecke. I live at 8400 Mippolomo Road, Malibu, California, 90265. Uh, my presentation uh, was deferred last hearing, so I presented the paper from a, representative, uh, a co congressman that represents our district, uh, which was in opposition to the uh, CUP. I presented that to the commission last time, so you should have that document in your file. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Excuse me, we have a question. Commissioner Dugas. The congressman for the area being? I'm embarrassed that I cannot repeat his name because I failed to bring my copy of the Okay, of are letter. you talking about Buck McKeon? Yes, I am talking about that gentleman. Uh, okay, and, and I thought uh, the congressman for the area was Julia Brownlee? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm afraid I have some egg on my face. I cannot uh, reply to that. Okay, but but that's um, Buck McKeon is is the congressman to to whom you are referring. Uh, th that's correct. Thank you. My name is Glenn Guestford. I live at 10777 Pacific View Road. When we walk out our front door, we look, at, we look across where the tigers will be. And we will also be hearing them at night. A 500-pound tiger at night. I mean, do you think that's not going to affect our neighborhood? It is. And we are very upset that this has gotten this far, that you have the audacity to think that five tigers in our neighborhood won't affect the environment. We are very affected, and we don't want them. Thank you. Uh, Terry Gusford. Uh, Terry Gusford, 10777 Pacific View Road. Uh, I was also prepared to read a letter last week by Congressman Buzz McKeon, and I think his main concern was that the fact that the first responders, should there be a, an incident, would probably not be prepared to uh, deal with tigers, and uh, there might be a lot of extra cost to the community or the system to try to train these people to deal with something that they're not actually accustomed to dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Betelier. Betelier. Tom uh, Keenan, followed by Carlos uh, Kurtz, or excuse me, Carol Kurtz. I, I submitted what I had to say to the clerk at the end of the last hearing. Okay, thank you. It was uh, Tom Keenan. Carol Kurtz. David, uh, excuse me, Donald Kushmer. Mike uh, Lem, 
L E U M. Lori Morris. Russ uh, Patel. Raul uh, Guerrero. Uh, Bonnie Shirk. Thank you. Van Royce uh, Viber, Bieber. Carter Ward. like three speaker cards in support of the CUP that we didn't have before. Um, Michael Hauser. Sai Yavandin. Okay. And Dr. Ina Talker. Talker. No? Okay. Andrew Guilford. I will call your card. Subsequent. Charles uh, Conte. Sir, it's Charles Cote. And I'm sorry. Uh, if it's okay, in the nature of a rebuttal, if, uh, they could put theirs on first because we're supposed to rebut what they want. The applicant will have the final opportunity to speak. Uh, Bernice Sendale, Sendel, nickname of Bibi. I apologize. <laughs> Could you give us your name and address, please? Uh, 1300 Berkshire, Beatrice Chuthill, and I go by Bibi, yes. I'm uh, a lifetime resident of the community, fourth generation. I retreated to that area after a very, very ugly divorce from a man here in the district attorney's office. So it was a devastating divorce. But I went to the Yerba Buena area, Deer Creek Road, Canyon, uh, Pacific View, and had a healing there. And I can't imagine anyone coming from anywhere having any type of healing when there are uh, wild animals, uh, lions roaring in the background. Not only is it tranquil, and we don't want to disturb or pollute that, but let's not forget that it's Indian burial grounds in that area as well. One of my earliest uh, recalls of memory as a child was my father fell off Magoo Rock uh, fishing. A surfer took him to Neptune's net. I couldn't imagine if he had uh, calmed himself down or maybe had a heart attack after by hearing the roar of lions. That w the lion issue wasn't there. It was calm and tranquil. I'm familiar with Neptune's Net since the Youngs owned it. That's Paul and Stephen. That's way before whoever owns it now, or Dolly and Paul. I managed it for Dolly and Paul. What hasn't been said here is that uh, these, this family uh, had these lions illegally without permits of any type, not even special event uh, permits. It's my belief that the tiger should be taken away from them and placed in a safe environment, a sanctuary and they should be fined and returned to Beverly Hills. 
and not allowed to live here. I don't believe that they're going planning on living here. It sounds like it's a cinder block home, uh, probably only to breed uh, lions. And the latest on the news is uh, lions are being used by drug dealers. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's funny. What, what are they going to do with these tigers up here? And I also want to tell you that uh, my uncle was Man, uh, Manuel Lopez, so he's been 40 years uh, in uh, local government. My father was his promoter. I'm very aware, and so it's not just my family duty, it's my civic duty to come up here and say something. Thank you. Question. Thank you. Carol Bush. Good morning. My name is Carol Bush. I have property on Pacific View. I have 11208, 11200, and 11202. I am about three minutes away from these tigers that are across the street. Um, first of all, these tigers are mutations. They're interbred, and a lot of the cubs come out so maldeformed, and uh, it's, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And the fact that they say they live in Malibu, they don't. They live in Beverly Hills. And... Um, my ranch is a corridor for the mountain lions and for the bobcats and for the deer. And being that I'm just, I can walk over to their place in about three to five minutes, depending on how fast I go. Uh, the fact that they want to put, uh, they say they're going to adopt other, uh, to, to bring their, their uh, group up to five. Well, um, first of all, one of those tigers costs fifty thousand dollars, and if you get it illegally, it costs a hundred thousand dollars. These women, there's no tigers in the movie industry these days. It's ridiculous. They do it all on video, and and uh, and so for these women to try to bring these tigers up there and call them the white tigers of Malibu is obscene. They're not indicative. I can't even cut down a sumac bush on my property. I have to go through such rigorous uh, examination for anything I want to do on the property and for these women to be able to come in there and put up these cages and bring white tigers. Now, the other thing is, one of them gets loose. There's been two that got loose in Simi Valley. It took them three weeks to find them and they shot and killed one right in front of the uh, Reagan Library. They both were killed. Now, if one of those tigers or two of those tigers gets or three whatever and they get into bony mountain and into little sycamore canyon where you have hikers and bikers you have to close down all the trails you're not going to be able to allow people to go onto the backbone trails and to go into that area that has been designated for recreational purposes and for people to view the beauty of that area so for me, I think it is absolutely insane. All you need is a, is a pair of bolt cutters. I can't tell you how many people that I've told this to that thinks it's the most ridiculous and obscene thing. But then you have the ones that want, oh, I want to go see them. I want to go look at them. That property is not secured to where nobody can transvest it. You can get over there as easy as possible. I know because I've been over there many a time. You know, I knew the former owner. This is um, just an obscene thing for a place that you people have considered one of the most gorgeous areas in the Santa Monica Mountains to do something like this and to have animals in there that are being bred that come out with cleft palates, club feet. They're interbred father to daughter, daughter to son. That's the only way they can keep the white line. So when they say they're going to adopt, who's going to give them three more white tigers? They're, they're up there for a breeding program, which is ridiculous. And uh, my son talked the last time we were here. I had to leave. And <clears throat> we've been there since 1972. My children were raised there. It's a beautiful area. My ranch is a designated Chumash Indian settlement. This is obscene to put animals that are not indicative of the area. 
we do enjoy the regular animals that are indicative. Our mountain lions, our bobcats, our deers, our coyotes, but white lions of Malibu? That's absurd. And like I said, once again, if one gets loose or if somebody wants to go take a look at them, if somebody takes some bolt cutters and goes over there and cuts that fence, uh, you guys are going to spend a fortune trying to find them, and especially in Boney Mountain there. And, and uh, people hike, bike, and, and come up to see the beauty of that area, and you're putting them all in danger. So I thank you very much. Okay? Thank you. Lisa Siderman. Carlos Siderman. Good morning. Carlos Siderman, 9871 Houston Road. Briefly, I want to, to thank you for the time spent into this subject. Uh, that tells me the considerations and the time put by the planning department in uh, seriously looking into the subject, and I'm very appreciative for that. Specifically, I want to mention uh, the position of the Santa Monica Mountain Conservancy, which uh, has been very active recently in the conservation of the natural uh, species of the area. And uh, in their letter, they expressed their concern in bringing a non-native tiger and the impact that that will happen to, to the native animals in the community. Further, uh, since last meeting, there were new pictures surfaced that it shows the way the tigers were walking up in areas, uh, pictures that we did not have necessarily before, uh, to the extent that it shows in Instagram some of the tigers walking in public areas, public canyons, uh, without a leash. And I think that that is very concerning for the community, not only to have them, not only the noise, but the behavior, which is exactly the behavior happening right now in the place where supposedly these tigers are housed. Again, thank you very, very much for the concern that you have put for our community, the time that you have put in analyzing. is very appreciated by, by the neighborhood. And by the time the planning department has put into, into the research. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Questions? Lee? Lisa Siderman, I didn't hear your comments. I'm sorry, I was, I was giving my time up. I see, thank you. Uh, Ralph Shapiro? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for, and, and members of the Commission. First, I wanted to say, as a resident of the area, I very much regret the level of acrimony that has developed over this issue between the two sides. Uh, I attempt to get along with all of my neighbors. Uh, if the applicants move to the area, I certainly intend to try to get along with them. Uh, I must say it was not a good start for me to read in the supplementary materials an accusation submitted by the applicants that all the people here in yellow hats are hired to be here by Mr. Siderman. Let me assure you, I am here to protect my neighborhood. No one has paid me. And that is true as well of all the neighbors who are here whom I, whom I know. We are here out of conviction. In that context, I'd like also to say, because we are here out of conviction and out of a genuine concern about our safety and the quality of life in our neighborhood, I think it's extremely impolite for the applicant's uh, booster area to be laughing and tittering at our speakers. It's happened at least twice already this morning, and uh, I, I personally would, would beg them to show the respect for our speakers that we have shown for theirs. Now, I've listened to all the hours of testimony that you have listened to. And I must say it's been quite overwhelming at times. There are great technical issues being debated here. None of us here 
in the audience is an expert on the safety, on the safe care of tigers. There have been issues debated here about how high the fences should be, whether there should be roofs on the enclosures, whether there should be double doors, the procedures for taking the tigers in and out of the enclosure 50 times a year, uh, and other technical issues. And I don't envy the commission the job of sorting through all that. However, you don't have to at this time. That is the role of an environmental impact report. CEQA says that where there are any significant, where there is any significant evidence presented of an effect on the environment, that an environmental impact report is required. The only exception, and it's the exception I, I'm sorry to say the county seems to be relying on, is where no one has shown any substantial evidence of a significant effect on the environment. Now, I, like you, have listened to literally scores of people who are heartsick with worry about the safety of their neighborhood. And I personally have presented evidence on what I anticipate to be the very disturbing quality of sounds that come from tigers placed on this property. And to find, as you must, if you would approve a negative declaration on this project, that not a single person here has raised any significant evidence of a substantial effect on the environment would be totally unjustified based on the evidence you've heard and frankly a slap in the face to all these residents who have appeared here to try to save the quality of life in their neighborhood. In order to approve this project at this point, you would have to make the certification of the negative declaration that there has been no significant evidence of a substantial effect on the environment and Commissioners, I don't think in good conscience you can hold that based on what you've heard. Now, you do need an EIR to approve this project at this time. You don't need an EIR to reject it. The evidence you have heard about the genuine horror of the residents at what's about to happen to their neighborhood, the evidence that you have heard on how utterly inconsistent this use is, this proposed use is, with the quiet and peaceful neighborhood where this facility is proposed to be placed, demonstrates, I think, that it's just not a good idea. It's not fair to people who have lived here much of their lives, who have invested their monies, their time, their lives in this neighborhood to have to be subjected out of the blue to this serious risk and these serious consequences. I submit that you should exercise your discretion to deny the CUP now as imposing unacceptable safety risks on this neighborhood and as being utterly inconsistent with the current uses of property in that area. I have just one other thing to add. Um, there's been a dispute about noise, how much noise tigers make when they roar. Staff took exception in the supplementary uh, document to uh, evidence that I had submitted, I think also you, a sound engineer had submitted, based on the assumption that tigers roar at a level of 114 decibels. Based on staff's exception, to that particular study, I went to the library. I found this book, Tiger, the Ultimate Guide, in the science section of the Los Angeles County Library. I have, it's by a leading expert in the field who has spent decades in India studying tigers. And uh, I have submitted with my paper an excerpt from this book, which states that tigers roar at a level of 120 decibels.
Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> I overlooked something earlier, if I can backtrack uh, on a procedural issue. Um, I meant to ask the, the commission whether there were any disclosures or addition of the disclosures other than what we, we uh, conveyed last meeting. No disclosures. Commissioner Dukas. Um, last time um, I made reference to a, a property listing for um, the subject property uh, using Redfin and I forgot to submit it. So I need to submit it. It's um, 11077 Pacific View Drive and it is the listing uh, listed on Redfin. The listing uh, that was referenced Zillow. Um, one called visualshows.com, which is another homes for sale, homes for rent, homes for lease, and Trulia, which is, which is another one. And the reason why I went to multiple ones is because first, the one that was given to us in our staff report referenced Zillow and you have to register. I'm not registered for that, I was registered for Redfin. But also that um, the listings are inconsistent with the project description and um, I discussed this with uh, uh, Mr. Baca uh, at the last hearing and uh, rather than speak for him, he can just share that information with the rest of the commission and the public. Um, also, I visited again um, and I took pictures of the, of the drive leading to the gate. And I noticed last time when I went in early February that there was um, remodeling debris that was uh, dumped in the in the gully off that drive, and um, six weeks later it was it was still there, and uh, I took pictures of that. So I want to submit that. Incidentally, um, the well that uh, that's it. The two pictures of of uh, the debris that's been left for six weeks, and then um, these these listings that, that show that uh, there's a, a newer house that's approximately 2,000 square feet. I think that's the one that people refer to as the cinder block house. The, the original house, the, the old house at um, 1650 square feet and then a guest house at 700 uh, square feet. So I wanna make sure that I put that in the record because I will be um, trying to get to the bottom of this. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Onstock? I have none. Commissioner Weston? Nothing further. And, and I have no further disclosure. Okay. <coughs> Continue with the speaker cards. Uh, Marlon Hale? Mary Cummins? Good morning, commissioners. My name is Mary Cummins, and I live at, I'm at 645 West 9th Street in Los Angeles. And I'm here today to support the CUP. Now, I've been a real estate broker and appraiser in California for over 30 years. I'm also an expert witness. And as you know, I did some of the research and wrote one of the letters for the CUP for the Lockwood Animal Sanctuary. Excuse me, can I stop you for a second? Did you speak last time? No. Oh, I thought I saw your name on a speaker card from the last meeting. Oh. Okay. I, my apologies. May I continue? And, yes, please. Okay. Anyway, you approved the CUP for the Lockwood Animal Sanctuary, which I did the research on and sent in a, a letter. I'm also president of Animal Advocates, and we rescue ill, injured, and orphaned native wildlife for release back to the wild. We rescue coyotes, bobcats, foxes, all the way down to bats. And I have um, a USDA permit and a fish and wildlife permit, similar to what the housers have for their animals. Now, I already sent in two letters. Now, all the issues in the first letter, I believe, have been um, dealt with. And I then called Brian and Jay, um, or they called me last week, and they gave me the list of the last four remaining issues or so. Now, one of the issues was density. They said that there were 28 residential properties homes within a half a mile radius 
and using public records MLS and Bing, I calculated that there were between seven and 12 homes, including the subject. Some of the properties are three parcels with one home, and some of them are vacant. And most important about the density is that there are no properties for miles and miles north of the subject property. That is wilderness area. And then to the west, there are two properties, and then there are, again, um, many miles of wilderness. Um, homes cannot be built there. This is one of the least dense places in the area. Now, they also said that they thought that the land use would be inconsistent. The land use of the subject property is identical to the neighbors. It is a family living in a house with animal enclosures. All the people around them, they have a home, and they have corrals, and they have barns, and they have fences. It is the exact same use. These animals are in an enclosure. They're not um, outside of the enclosure. And another issue was the distance to the two camps, which were between three and six miles away. Now, if you remember with the Lockwood Animal Sanctuary, there was a Boy Scout camp, which was four miles away. And that CUP was approved. So that is a similar distance to the two camps that are next to this property. Now, the other issue was public safety. Um, I've known, and I want to first disclose, I'm not being paid to be here today, even though I do this for a living. I'm here because I've known the Housers for many years. I've known their animals. We have the same veterinarians. And I support what they're doing, and I know that they're doing a wonderful job. Now, they've had a perfect record with Fish and Wildlife and with USDA ever since they started. I believe it's about 13 years. Um, they have triple and double door cages. And one thing that everyone who has a USDA or a Fish and Wildlife permit, we all must have written um, emergency plans for natural disasters, evacuations, or escapes. We must have recapture equipment and phone trees of everyone that we have to call. These things are already done. Now, as a real estate appraiser for over 30 years, having an animal in enclosure is not going to affect the values of the neighboring properties. We're not talking about tigers running around in the fields. They're in an enclosure. They're not out. They're, they won't be able to be seen, and they most likely won't be able to be heard. And one person sent in a letter stating that they spoke to their insurance agent, and the agent said that they would um, either raise their rates or cancel the insurance policy. Um, Insurance for a property covers natural disasters like fires, floods, and earthquakes. It does not cover something that could happen from um, another source or a person or being these things. So it, it would not affect the insurance at all. And another issue that some of these people have brought up is the sound of the roar of the tiger. I've known these tigers for many years, and I've only heard them make slight little sounds when they're eating. I have never heard a roar out of them. And if anyone is really concerned about the sound in the area, um, the, I was out there on Saturday to do sound readings, and the sound of the motorcycles going through the canyon is much louder than any possible sound from any of their animals. Oh, and, and one other issue about the public safety. Um, the chances of, I mean, statistics have shown that you are much more likely to be killed by a horse or a dog than by a tiger. And then, of course, you're still more likely to be killed by a car or a human. In fact, um, last night I got an emergency alert from LA Animal Services saying that there's a mountain lion in the area near um, Tahunga. And um, these mountain lions are out there. They're protected. And if they really thought that a, a large tiger mountain lion out there was an issue of public safety, then we should get rid of all the local mountain lions, which, of course, we can't. Now, I've done a bit of research into this, and I believe that the main person behind the opposition to the CUP is the neighbor, Carlos Sitterman, who's at 10995 Pacific View. Um, he doesn't live there, but he runs a business there, even though it's a residential property. He needs a CUP to have the business. He's had it there since 2005, <coughs> and he incorporated in 2011. <coughs> he previously tried to buy the property from the previous owner. And um, his main reason is he wants to be able to have a horse trail from his property into the state park. Excuse me. What does, what are your comments, how do they relate to the topic at hand? Well, I, I believe... I mean, these are periphery issues as yes. to motivation of, of a the, neighbor. I believe that is the main motivation behind the opposition to the CUP. Mr. Sidman wants okay, the property. We need, okay, we need to keep the, the comments on topic. Okay. 
Anyway, I've known the Housers and their veterinarian and their animals for many, many years. I support what they do. They have a perfect track record when it comes to public safety and health. And um, I support the CUP as a real estate expert, um, broker, and appraiser. I don't see it affecting the neighbors. And um, I would request the commissioners to approve the CUP. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes all the cards we had, with the exception of two cards, and I've called those names already, uh, Mr. Goford and Mr. I'm sorry. I'm Marlon Hale, author of the Noise Study Report. Uh, Go ahead and repeat yourself in front of the mics, please. Marlon Hale, 663 Bristol Avenue, Simi Valley, California. Thank you. I, I did uh, testify at the last hearing. I'm the author of the Noise Study Report for uh, no tigers in Malibu. And so um, uh, there's been some discussion back and forth about a few topics uh, relating to noise that I would like to address associated with this. With this, And I'm in receipt of a memorandum to the commission from Mr. Baca, who raises a number of issues in the noise data report. And I mostly concur with his critique, as a matter of fact. It's very difficult to find real, legitimate, and verifiable information on tigers and their vocalizations. However, <clears throat> I'm also in receipt of a noise study done by RINCON, a, a, an excellent environmental consulting firm here in Ventura, addressing this issue. And uh, they have gone to the uh, current location where the tigers are, are, are enclosed and made some uh, a sound study. Um, I'd like to address that and I'd like to that issue and then I'd like to address the 114 dB versus the 114 dBA issue raised by by a staff. <clears throat> In the Rincon report it uh, they went to the property uh, where the tigers are currently housed, and they uh, made measurements from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on March the 13th. And I believe you have a copy of, of their report. And their conclusion was that they did not um, encounter any tiger vocalizations. They encountered some monkeys at the at the site that were playing and making noise, but uh, since they did not encounter any uh, tiger vocalizations, they felt that uh, the problem didn't exist. I'm referring, however, to um, Mr. Baca's memo where he quotes Dr. Tite's um, duration of lion roarings per hour. It's a very good document. I didn't have access to this previously, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to have this available. Pardon, pardon me for interrupting, but um, do you mean lions? Well, I don't mean lions, but the document presented to you okay. by... Uh, in, previously, we've had a couple of speakers that have, have said that. lions instead of tigers, but uh, you are talking indeed I'm talking about tigers, lions. and now I have a document here about lions. And my testimony last time pretty much follows exactly what is right here in this table, that the tigers also roar in the evenings and nighttime and, and don't do any roaring pretty much during the daytime. And that's carried out right here in this table. Thank you. Okay, and looking at this, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 3 p.m., no roars of any of the lions studied over a 10 to 16 day period. So it's not surprising that if we're trying to make measurements of sound of vocalizations of tigers and we do it between the hours of 11 a.m. and 3 p.m., we're going to miss it. I've looked at this table and uh, following the very uh, methodology that uh, Mr. Baca has used, looking at one lion roaring and five lions roaring, I've discovered that the county noise ordinance will be exceeded for the time periods 
for two tigers and two and five tigers roaring during the hours that this table represents. Measured over a period of 10 to 16 days, averaged, there were two lions roaring. Between the hours of 9 p.m. till uh, 11 p.m. and from 2 a.m. till 6 a.m., which is in the nighttime, the uh, county noise ordinance would be exceeded by the tigers roaring at 114 decibels at one meter and they would violate the ordinance at the nearest residence to the west of the proposed site. Now, addressing the issue of DB versus DBA. Uh, it is a frustration to me and to other acousticians to go into the literature, even sometimes in, by authors in our own discipline, and we find DB referenced and SPL, sound pressure level referenced, sound level referenced, DBA referenced, DBC referenced. We have to make sure what they're talking about. In acoustics, as in electric light bulbs, we have two different important characteristics. One is called the sound power level. One is called the sound pressure level. The sound power level is a characteristic of the source. 100, 150 watts. You can take that and move that light bulb anywhere you want in the universe, and that light bulb is still going to be a 150 watt light bulb. It's a characteristic of the source. But its position relative to an observer determines how many lumens or how much candle power is available to the receiver. And that same analogy applies in acoustics. The acoustical power is a characteristic of the source and is used in the modeling calculations of different noise sources. And the, the pressure, sound pressure level, is a, is a positional relationship uh, characteristic. If my source is over there and I'm right next to it, it's louder, it's brighter. If my source is over there and I'm way over here, it's dimmer, it's quieter. So sound pressure level always needs to have a position associated with it. And we find throughout the literature references to decibel levels, sound pressure levels, sound levels with no reference to location. In one study that I recently found, actual recordings were made in, in Africa of these big cats, not tigers, lions. The recordings and I can understand this, were made at a distance of 300 meters. Who's going to walk up with a microphone to a wild cat, and, and a big cat, and, and try and get a sound level off from it? Dr. Teitz has referenced 114 dB. <clears throat> Mr. Baca's memo quotes this author, and he says, quoted the same author that I quoted in my noise study referring to tiger roars as being 114 dBA at one meter when Mr. Tights actually said 114 dB. Mr. Tights uh, and indicates that Mr. Tights, as, that Mr. Tights did a, a tiger roar study using a deceased tiger and the larynx of a deceased tiger using a compressor blowing air through it to get his measurement. However, he also is quoted in an article that I quoted in my report. That it, the article is entitled Born to Roar, quote, a lion's or tiger's roar can reach 114 decibels to someone standing a few feet away, which is about 25 times as loud as a gas lawnmower. I'm quoting Dr. Tice. Now, to me, there's clues in that as to what he means. 
Note that Dr. Tights in his article quoted states that the tiger's roar can reach 114 decibels to someone standing a few feet away, which is about 25 times as loud as a gas lawnmower. I assume by someone he means a human being. Listening to the loudness of both a tiger and a lawnmower. How loud is a lawnmower? I've got a table here that shows a lawnmower is 100 dBA at 3 feet, which is about 1 meter, and in decibel math, 25 times 100 dBA is 114 dBA. The term someone and loud and comparable and these other words that are used in his article refer to human listening, listeners. And the human sensitivity, listening sensitivity, is described as A-weighted sound level or db a weighted sound level or DBA. So in looking at the context, I conclude that when he's talking about loudness and he's talking about a, and I've got here the S, sound pressure level DBA SPL. Gas lawnmower at three feet, 100 DBA. 25 times that, 114 DBA. So following the logic and the decibel math of Dr. Tice is 114 dBA for a human being at three feet. Better have a fence between you and him. So uh, basically, if there's any questions, I, those are the only two points I want, I've been asked to address at this time. Give me a Sharon Can question. you estimate the noise level at the nearest residence? Yes. And what is that? Following the, uh, just I'll just pick pick a couple of, of points here. We have at between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. where there were 0.85 minutes per hour per lion. The sound level at the nearest residence would be 44.8 dBA. And for five, following Mr. Baca's analogy in the next paragraph of his memo, five during that hour also roaring, that'd be 51.7 dBA. Does that exceed county standards? Yes, it does. Okay. By how much? Uh, county standards is 45 dBA at night. Yep. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Dukas. Have you had occasion to go to the project site? Yes, the proposed project site. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have. And and so have I. Um, what uh, struck me just in general is that um, that is an extremely quiet area. It is. It's unusually quiet, and I've been to every corner of Ventura County as, as many of my fellow commissioners have had to do in the course of our visiting um, places. Does that make a, a difference when you have the, the background being so utterly quiet and, um, and whatever introduced noises, for example, a motorcycle passing by? Does that make a difference? In the county's noise standard, it has two different approaches to uh, compliance. One has to do with a fixed noise level that during the daytime is 55 dBA at the residential pro uh, residence. At uh, nighttime, it is 50 dBA, or evening time, it is 50 dBA. And by the way, the county day starts at 6 a.m. Most places at 7 a.m., but in Ventura County, it starts at 6 a.m. And the uh, nighttime limit is uh, 45 dBA at the residence. That's the fixed noise standard. The ambient-based noise standard, the limit is ambient plus 3. And so, yes, if that's all it was, ambient plus 3, it would be significantly uh, violated throughout the entire period, except when they're not making any, any noises. However... 
in the standard it says the greater of the two. So quiet noise areas don't get the benefit of protection. Could you say that again? Somebody dropped something and made some noise. I couldn't hear what you said. So quiet areas in the county do not get the benefit of code protection uh, because they're quiet. And in this area, any sound, I could clearly understand conversations that were occurring when I was at the Siderman property and then up at the residence, which is elevated above to the west, which is elevated above the Siderman property, property could clearly hear conversations on the next road to the east, which is, I'd say, probably a good half mile away. What about on the trail? It's very close to a trailhead to the Sereno, Serrano Valley. Were you, were you able to go there? I wasn't at the trailhead exactly. I was at the various residences and at the sta uh, Siderman Stables, which is actually the closest uh, uh, occupied property occupied but, by horses <laughs> occupied property next to the to the proposed project well I'm, I'm i'm talking i'm referring to an area where you know the public hikes you can you can reach this this trailhead directly just on a, a road that that runs behind the property and it dumps you out at the at the trailhead you can also reach it um from sycamore canyon la jolla it's it's all connected with the backbone trail Right. What, did you have uh, any any chance to go in that area? I did not. Okay. I just cannot emphasize enough how utterly quiet this area is, and I think it has something to do with its its remoteness and uh, and just the the shape of the area. It's it, does that make a difference? Well, the shape of the area can create kind of an amphitheater type situation, but sound. If it has a direct line of sight and there's not a lot of ground cover, it just goes. And low frequency sound goes forever. It's very difficult to stop a long, 20 foot long wavelength to low frequency sound. High frequency sound, the air itself begins to mitigate it as it propagates through. So quietness out there is a, uh, in any quiet area, it doesn't matter where it is, any sound can be heard and a startling sound can be very startling thank you any other questions no thank you, thank you. okay i have uh, the two speaker cards i spoke of before i'll uh, the commission also received a letter from uh, mr mike bradbury requesting the opportunity to speak uh, again i don't see him in the audience I don't know if he'll show up or not. Um, Andrew uh, Guilford. Mr. Chair, we, we had asked for the opportunity to respond to the applicant's rebuttal. That was Mr. Bradbury's written request as well. And so um, we would defer until after the rebuttal and then understanding that the applicant may have limited comments in response to you understand the applicant will have the final opportunity to speak. We do. Since it's and been five weeks since the applicant's presentation, um, we are expecting that they may hear new information to which we would like to respond today, understanding that once we respond with very brief comments, that the applicant may have a limited response as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Conte. Would you speak? Would you come up to the uh, podium, please? I note that uh, opposing counsel did not. Um, if it's okay with the commission, uh, if Ms. Hauser could present, and then I can hear from Mr. Guilford, and then I'll defer my comments to the end. That's fine. Um, who's going to be your speaker? And would you fill out a speaker card before you leave? Again. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Planning Commissioners. Uh, I'm Eric Nagy from Jensen Design and Survey, representing the applicant, Irina Hauser. And uh, we'd like to uh, present our rebuttal and address some of the issues brought up in the previous hearing on February 13th, as well as uh, some of the information presented to your commission today. 
regarding noise, in addition to staff's response to the noise study provided by Mr. Hale previously, uh, we have presented your commission with a noise study prepared by Rincon Consultants that uses measurements from the actual tigers. Uh, that study found potential impacts to noise levels from the tigers to be less than significant. Uh, and uh, in response to Mr. Hale's comments, with all due respect, the uh, lion study he references is uh, for a different species on a different continent. It uh, was made in the wild with wild animals and is not representative of or comparable to the subject tigers. Uh, I encourage you to base your decision on the study of the actual tigers that we've presented to your commission. Uh, regarding biological resources, staff has also addressed the comments Regarding biological resources, there is a new comment letter from the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy warning of potential biological impacts. Uh, but that letter does not appear to be from a qualified biologist, nor does it cite testimony from a biological expert. Um, CDFW and planning biologists have reviewed the project and concluded that no significant impacts to biological resources would occur, and I'd like to emphasize that. Uh, we do have a couple requested condition changes, and it appears that staff has addressed a couple of those from the previous hearing. Uh, we re request that condition one be revised to accommodate up to five tigers. Four tigers, of course, would still be acceptable per our discussion at the last hearing, and it seems as though staff has uh, allowed your commission to have an option in that regard. I'm uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Yes. Uh, we request that condition one be revised to accommodate up to five tigers. Uh, per our discussion at the previous hearing, four would be an acceptable number for us, and it seems as though staff has allowed your commission the leeway to uh, change that number. Uh, we also request that condition one be re uh, revised to require a chain link roofed arena. I didn't necessarily see that language in there. Um, of course, that's pursuant to uh, the discussions at the previous hearing. Um, and we'd like to address the height. Um, it's, the, the fencing comes in six foot sections, so if we could have the uh, fence height be 12 to 15 feet with the roof, and that would depend on the structural analysis. And that would also be uh, addressed through the building and safety permit process, of course. Uh, we request that condition 7B be modified to, an allow, to allow an effective permit term starting two years from occupancy clearance. This was uh, also brought up in the previous hearing. Uh, that's usually done by building and safety, and that's when the Tigers can actually occupy the property. That's more representative of the two-year term, I believe, that staff is trying to provide to the permittee here. Uh, uh, or the other option, of course, would be 10 years with a two-year review and reporting periods to your commission. Uh, all of the other proposed conditions and safety plan revisions are acceptable to us. We feel that staff has done an excellent job in that regard in uh, providing conditions that will allow your commission to approve the project. Uh, and again, we'd like to emphasize that the project is consistent with all county regulations and staff found the project to have no significant environmental impacts. Uh, there is no substantial evidence to support denial of the CEP. And uh, again, we feel that speculative fear should not drive your commission's decision. We respectfully ask your commission to take the actions on page 23 of the original staff report and approve PL 1311. I'd like to introduce Irina Hauser now, who will address the remainder of the issues from the last hearing, including tigers at their residence and uh, transportation safety. So we'll do a PowerPoint now. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Thank you again for hearing us. The last time we had the opportunity to address you, we spoke about providing a better, safer life for our two tigers while creating no impact to our neighbors or the surrounding environment. Given the presentation made by the opposition, we are here today to directly respond both to the valid issues raised by the Planning Commission and our neighbors, as well as to provide you with an accurate record in response to certain misinformation provided to the Commission previously, and perhaps intentionally so. 
The opposition has relied on fear, intimidation, and misinformation to convince some in the community to oppose this CUP. The opposition's presentation at the previous hearing was an apparent attempt to call our reputation into question, if not to destroy it. However, we must emphasize and repeat that we have received no citations for violations and no injuries have been suffered by anyone over the entirety of the many years we have been working with these animals. Our unblemished record is the direct result of our absolute commitment and adherence to stringent safety measures and the professional manner in which we care and interact with these animals. Unfortunately, it is easy to instill fear in certain people if they are told lies or even in some instances threatened. However, although it may sometimes prove difficult to keep an open mind and evaluate actual facts before making a decision, if the Commission does so here, we are confident that it will approve CUP PL 13-0011. Staff's stated concern is the population de density around the, our 19 acres. The CEQA report states that there is absolutely no environmental impact. Virtually every single finding is in our favor, including correct zoning, significantly exceeds size requirements, exceeds all federal and state requirements, no environmental impact, no noise impact, no impact on water, fire, wildlife, no adverse effect on utility of neighboring property or uses. Legal precedent already exists consistent with the general plan, consistent with the county's coastal program, and compatible with surrounding development. F staff found that it is not for reasonably foreseeable that the tigers would escape. The staff compared our property to one of the already permitted properties within the county, but it's important to distinguish the Martin property from ours. The Martin property, which is permitted for 100 animals, has 19 out of 29 developed lots, or 62% versus our application for a maximum of five, which has 26 developed out of 56 or 46%. We actually have less density of residences. <clears throat> a better comparison though than the Martin property would be the property where their tigers are currently housed in Los Angeles County and have been for many years. Within a three mile radius, there are several hundred homes, schools, parks, and there's a new housing development that will be built within a few thousand feet. Can I interrupt you? Sure. Why don't you give us the address of where they're currently housed? And uh, give us a it's on Tick Canyon, geographic, geographic it's, explanation of where it's at. It's on Tick Canyon in Canyon Country, uh, Santa Clarita area in, in California. Thank you. And there's some housing developments all around it. Like, and, and how long have they been there? Since, since we f f first started. So... Uh, 12 13. years, 12 years, the older Thank one's 12, 13, 13 years. Almost. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Additionally, people ride horses past the property on a regular basis with absolutely no issues. There's absolutely no impact on the neighbors or the neighborhood, and there are many times more animals than we plan to have, including tigers, lions, primates, bears, etc. We will build enclosures on the new subject property that not only meet but exceed all regulatory requirements. Proper building permits will be obtained. A structural engineer will verify all enclosures will be reinforced to withstand fire, earthquake, wind, and of course the strength of our tigers. Then the appropriate federal and state government agencies will inspect the enclosures prior to bringing the tigers. Our location is perfect for this project because it is isolated, rural, private, secluded, and surrounded by wild, mountainous terrain. There are no parcels to the back of our subject property and the property is, and the project is located at the back of the subject parcel. And the tigers would be housed towards the rear of the parcel. The density argument is the only foundation of the recommendation to deny our application, but that argument is not justifiable. As far as the property values and disclosures, letters were sent from professionals which discussed the fact that no negative impact can, will exist from our CUP.
In fact, homes around other similar facilities have increased in value at least as much as other properties in the area, if not more. The fact that a unique property exists in the neighborhood often increases the values of the properties around it. The opposition cited Disclosure 1103.2 this code specifically discloses flood, fire, earthquake, and other natural disaster hazards, which has nothing to do with tigers. In terms of our safety plan, we are well ahead of most licensed facilities. Under local, state, and federal laws, the only requirement is that there is one person on site, and that person does not even have to be a trainer. Several experts have spoken to explain that even in a huge animal park or zoo that is open to the public, Typically, one person is left after closing in order to alert others in case of an emergency. In our case, we go above and beyond the legal requirement and require that this person be a qualified trainer. Furthermore, it does not require different teams to load each tiger. No facility in California has two, tigers on, two trainers on site for each animal. Once the animal is loaded and secured in the truck enclosure, the next animal is prepared, loaded, and secured. This process is much quicker than what most experience, even with horses, because our animals are so eager to go into the truck. Because the brush and terrain in the facility where they currently reside is very similar to this property, except that the brush there is even drier than at the current facility, we have on several occasions been very close to a brush fire. As a necessity, we have conducted drills to determine the duration of the evacuation process as well as prepared to evacuate on several occasions due to the proximity of the fire. During these drills, it took us less than 15 minutes to prepare and load our tigers into the trucks. Because our animals are conditioned to the vehicles and enjoy their time in the vehicles, they load very quickly. We recently discussed having a drill with the captain of the fire department near the property in question, and you will be happy with the results. Of course, in extreme circumstances, if they cannot be loaded safely, we will work with the fire department to set up a shelter in place. They can be left in the exercise pen with the swimming pool and concrete surrounded by clearing, and we will add that to our safety plan. We also have a fire hydrant on site to assist. No person will ever be placed on danger. Safety is always our primary concern. As we have stated time and time again, safety is our number one priority for our trainers, our tigers, and the community. However, at every turn, the opposition seeks to lump us together with all of the rule breakers and all of the people who have no business working with exotics. The case of the Moore Park Tiger is a perfect example of this. Let's analyze this particular situation because it was within this county and it emphasizes many of the issues of how problems with wild animals occur due to individuals with records or serious infractions who do not do things properly and who do pose a clear and present danger. The individual who owned these tigers was a criminal and has been convicted on several felony counts relating to his care of the animals. He had previous animal violations prior to this incident, was fleeing another county due to his hazardous conduct with respect to keeping of these wild animals, and brought these animals into Moore Park completely illegally and kept them there. This tiger, along with several other wild animals, was placed in crates and enclosures which were not inspected, completely illegal, and completely unsafe. The tiger was not the only animal to escape this facility. When the authorities came to the property, they found three lions, two tigers, a snow leopard, bobcats, and lynx. Some were in the barn, and some were running around. There were no proper permanent cages on the Moorpark property whatsoever, and it was no surprise to the investigators that the tiger escaped. The owner had absolutely no permission to house these animals at that location and had never applied for any type of CUP and had not alerted officials to the fact that he was in the area, had lied to authorities claiming that the animal was not his even after it had been out for two weeks. He also did not socialize and condition his tigers as we do to respond to its name. Unfortunately, its escape was not reported, and when it was discovered weeks later, 
was denied multiple times by this individual. This is a perfect example of why rules and regulations with respect to these animals are so important. And it is equally as important that people who follow proper procedures are able to obtain proper permits. The last thing we need is people to be afraid of the process and for people like this individual to own wild animals without proper permits and inspections. But despite all of these issues, although the tiger was out for four weeks, it did not hurt anyone. It was in an extremely densely populated area. In fact, officials were convinced that it roamed within a mile of a school for over two weeks and did not cause any trouble. Additionally, goats, chickens, and other animals were left out in order to try to capture this animal. However, because it did not know how to hunt, it did not even attempt to hurt these animals. In fact, the necropsy report showed that it had not eaten in two weeks prior to its death. Conversely, we spent years training and learning how to properly care for wild animals prior to applying for our permits and prior to obtaining our tigers. We have absolutely no violations and no injuries through all of our years working with these animals. We spent about five years prior to properly applying for a CEP working with county staff to evalu evaluate every potential property in order to find the most appropriate property. We have complied and cooperated with staff at every step of the process. Moreover, their enclosures have been and will be constructed by the same company that the state of Ohio uses for its new facility. And all of the enclosures and the exercise pen will have a roof and multiple layers of security. Comparing us to this criminal is completely unjustified, but it shows the constant attempt by the opposition to mislead others without providing the facts. Additional safety concerns were raised with respect to our mobilization equipment. For emergencies, and as a last resort, there is, where there is a direct threat to human life, we do own a 40 caliber Glock, which is powerful enough to take down a tiger, and we are trained to use it. But we have an extensive safety plan setting out a list of procedures, safety equipment, and agencies that must be notified immediately in case of emergency. It includes a tele-inject system, a special device which operates like a rifle and is equipped with special darts that tranquilize the animal, for which we took a special class and received certification. Another speaker brought up that horses will act differently in the presence of predators. However, predators like packs of coyotes, bobcats, and mountain lions currently exist and roam freely in the area. Additionally, he conceded that many horses are afraid of cows or plain cardboard cutouts as well. As many experts have testified, our tigers will have no additional impact on horses. Many facilities have horses and various other livestock within sight, smell, and sound of the tigers with absolutely no impact. Additionally, you have heard testimony of horses being led near other tigers on set for the very first time with absolutely no reaction. Furthermore, there are many large equestrian facilities that share roads and trails within facilities that house tigers with no adverse reactions, including near the Los Angeles Zoo. You also have a letter from a world-renowned preeminent equestrian center in the Southern Hemisphere where Olympic trials are conducted right past facilities that house tigers. Finally, you have seen pictures of the tigers and horses meeting for the first time in a very positive manner and of horses living in close proximity to tigers and lions. Several speakers from the opposing side agreed that the keeping of the cats on premises was not the concern rather than transport of the animals. Again, we would like to stress that we were asked to provide the maximum number, which is what we did. But the important thing here is that our extremely strict safety protocol is the priority. We drive the truck through two separate gates, closing and latching each gate into a fully enclosed area before the tiger is allowed into the exercise pen and into the truck. Even though we currently have no limits whatsoever placed on the number of times we take them off premises, we agree to limit their movement in order to satisfy concerns as part of the CEP.
There are already many productions that occur in Malibu that use wild animals, far more than our maximum of 60 trips. Typically, production or event coordinators obtain the proper permits for the specific job. They are driven on the same windy roads and PCH. In our situation, our animals travel in pickup trucks, which have been built to specifications and reinforced with self-sufficient transfer enclosures within the vehicle. These transfer enclosures have even been tested in roll situations, as the letter from the expert explains. Our methodology of transport has been tested and used by many companies in this area. No issues, injuries, or escapes have ever been documented to occur during this type of transport, and no incidents have occurred, according to staff, due to these wild anim animal permitted projects. Instead, most issues have occurred with horses. We address the concerns of people opposing our application based on the location of the property, and we address the people who oppose our application based on the concerns over transport. We would now like to address the people who voice concerns over anyone working with wild animals. This issue has been in the news lately because of the hugely successful film Blackfish. The equivalent of this film in the big cat and elephant community is Tim Harrison's award-winning film called Elephant in the Living Room. Even Mr. Harrison, who fought vigorously for more rules and regulations and who is vehemently opposed to keeping any wild animals as pets, wrote a lengthy letter in support of our application because he knows that we do things the right way with the safety of our animals, our trainers, and the community as, at large as our first priority. Another expert who spoke at the last meeting had decades of experience and co consults for the USDA regarding big cats. He clarified some of the issues brought up at the last hearing in a letter he presented. A person like this would never speak on our behalf unless this was the right thing. All of these people are speaking on our behalf strictly because we have the facts, reputation, and regulations on our side. People who argue against working with, with animals often assert that these animals are unpredictable, which is a little misleading. Underlying the common reaction to traumatic animal incidents lurks a contemporary human expectation that the world should be risk-free. We fully expect to be protected at all times from all things. But nature cannot and should not be tamed. Each species and each individual animal is endowed with a well-established range of behaviors and rarely acts in conflict to these. Understanding and correctly predicting animal behavior is among the most basic challenges and responsibilities of any trainer. This is precisely why an animal, which has been properly conditioned and socialized by professionals, is magnitude safer than one which has no contact and no socialization. Having said that, we never forget that these are wild animals. Animals are often held accountable for their actions, but they all always just simply act as animals. And people are responsible for minimizing situations in which harm may come to anyone. Why is it when tens of thousands of people die in automobile accidents, we do not seek to ban cars? Or when people die on mountains, we do not seek to outlaw mountain climbing. In the U.S., over 200 people a year die due to horses, but we do not outlaw horses. But whenever a wild animal injures someone, there is such an outcry. The reasons are animal attacks are rare, which makes them dramatic and newsworthy. Few people actually professionally work with wild animals or experience them firsthand, and it is much easier to blame, condemn, and legislate out of existence sometimes something you do not fully understand and that does not fully affect you. People, and three, people do not take into account the fact that many times the individual who gets hurt was doing something improper or even illegal. Yet all of these are lumped together. As stated previously, several states, even with the, within the U.S., have absolutely no regulations when it comes to these animals. And often incidents occur because unprofessional people deal with these animals without proper safety provisions. Or as in the case of the Moorpark 
tiger, people do not follow the law and keep these animals in illegally. The loudest voices heard in the wake of traumatic animal incidents sees any tragedy as an opportunity to say these animals belong in the wild or these animals belong away from people. This death proves it. No, nearly every species of animal can be superbly maintained in captivity where they are able to ri live rich lives that, they are quite a, that are quite a bit longer and more comfortable than in the wild. For example, the average tiger lives 8 to 10 years in the wild and 18 to 20 in captivity. We can learn from such creatures and enjoy them and share them with millions of people, especially young people, who will grow to care about the natural world. These animals are not demeaned or mistreated and are not yearning for freedom. With this project, they will have plenty of space, excellent nutrition, and fabulous lives in an extremely safe environment. And again, these animals can no longer exist in the wild. Our incident-free record is a testament to our supreme concern for safety and the additional precautions we take on a daily basis to ensure that this record stay intact. Animals share their worlds with us, and in doing so, bring immeasurable joy to our lives. We are, not af we are afraid not of them, but for them. We want them to be preserved in the wild and captivity by skilled and dedicated experts. Working with animals is safe and immeasurably beneficial for humans and animals. I want to briefly address the pictures w with which those opposed to the CUP suggest an implied recklessness. I will not take up your time discussing pictures one by one as many of the pictures are out of context or even do not involve our tigers. But you should know that all safety measures are always taken when dealing with these animals and that is always our primary concern. We have always employed all safety measures and have never hidden what we do with these animals from the government from the community or government regulators. We have stated, we have never stated or implied that we have no contact with these animals because we do believe that proper and safe contact provides a much more enriched and much safer life for these animals and those around them. This is not just our belief, but, pro but our professional opinion based on knowledge, experience, science, and the support of the animal community. For example, when our three-month-old cub met the author of the best-selling novel, Tiger's Curse, she did so in an extremely safe, prepared environment. Two layers of fencing were in place, one with panels and one permanent around the property, as well as a leash, and yes, it was an extremely positive experience for everyone involved, including the cub. Five trainers were there with the cub to ensure safety. At the time, we called officials at the city of Beverly Hills, explained what we were planning to do, and asked whether we would need any special permits. We were told that we would not need any special permits to what we already had at the time because of the special rules pertaining to cubs. Because it was a, not a public event, because it was not a film pro production, and because she would not be housed there, we were told we would not need any additional permits to what we already had at the time. At the last meeting, opposition presented information that a permit should have been issued. We were surprised to hear this information and immediately contacted the City of Beverly Hills Planning Department. We met with Code Enforcement Manager Mr. Nestor Otazu. We explained that we had all of the federal and state permits and that prior to bringing the cub we called the city. Mr. Otazu clarified the confusion and sta stated that BHMC regulates otherwise prohibited and non-domesticated animals by special permit. This special permit is typically issued through our animal service provider, in this case, Los Angeles City Animal Services Department. In cases where such animals are brought into the city for a specific event such as parties or filming, the purpose of this permit is to ensure the general safety and welfare of the public as well as the subject animal. This type of confusion is not unusual since the city of LA has different regulations and would not require a special permit for something like this. And since the city of LA is the animal service provider for the city of Beverly Hills and the laws are not consistent, 
this type of confusion is not uncommon. He not only stated that it was conceivable that we received that response, that the permit was not required for our situation, but that the law, even as written today, is meant to protect the public from, much, from a much larger and older animals who could pose an actual threat to public safety. This type of confusion is not unusual, as many regulations have changed over the last 15 years with respect to wild animals. For example, it used to be perfectly legal for members of the general public to take pictures with adult tigers, although we never did that. And the rules for members of the general public changed to be six months, and now they're three months or 35 pounds. In fact, here's a picture of the son of one of our most vehement opponents with someone's tiger cub. Let me explain what happens on a shoot. Typically, one is unable to see everything in the background. The entire idea of a film or photo shoot is to provide the viewer with an image that the production is trying to relate, not to provide the behind-the-scenes preparation that goes into it. In our limited experience, 15 minutes of shooting can often take six to eight hours of setup prior to arrival. And some shoots are done on a green screen, and then the background is added later. Other times, first the animal shots are completed, and then all the shots of the people are done separately. Then this is spliced together to look like they were together in one shot. Although from time to time we do a commercial project, most of the work we do is educational, often for charity, such as the one we did recently for the Children's Hospital Benefit. We hope this gives you a clear picture of those photos, what those photos actually represent, that our safety record is impeccable and that safety always comes first. The pictures on the Porsche was not of us transporting the tiger as the opposition tried to lead you to believe, but was for an ad, which again was done very safely. Again, it was parked in an enclosed gated area with five trainers present. She was on a leash, which was later taken out in a post-production edit. Cub was three months old, and I want to point out she did not use her claws or scratch the car in any way. This reinforces her conditioning, showing that she is comfortable in new situations. And yes, we have it on our website because we are allowed to do that. It was completed very quickly and was an extremely positive experience for her. We do not hide what we do with them as we have no reason to do so, but instead insist on making sure it is done properly and safely for everyone involved. Furthermore, unlike the misleading comments that we allow members of the public, or as the opposition said, toddlers, actually teenage members of our family, to pet our tigers, shown in the pictures, all of the people in the pictures with an adult tiger are well-trained members of our family within the confines of fenced areas. We have already discussed the pictures at the beach where law enforcement was present, and we have brought these permits for you. There are limited pictures from various jobs that we have done over the years. Unfortunately, we do not have time or an opportunity to take pictures when on a shoot, so we are very limited to what we have. Also, please be aware that many film and photo shoots already occur within Malibu. Tigers, lions, and other wild animals are already transported in and out of Malibu for various shoots. Furthermore, we do not have a swimming pool at any residence, although we do hope to build one for the tigers on the property if allowed by building and safety. Pictures one and two show swimming pools are not our homes, and the tiger in picture two is not even ours. It is imperative that we socialize and condition these animals with our family of trainers and with our dogs. There is a reason why we have no injuries or incidents. Neither of our tigers is declawed, and they both grew up interacting with our dogs, including a miniature pincher, completely safely. The pictures and video of the Doberman tiger playing were with our first tiger over 11 years ago when she was a young cub. This type of socialization improves the safety for all involved. So what may seem like just play is actually a well-supervised and monitored opportunity to properly socialize and condition our tigers. Furthermore, we are so safety conscious that although we socialize our tigers with our dogs when they are young and allow supervised play, once they can hurt the dog by just virtue of their size, we do not allow them to play except through the safety of caging between them. 
and the comment by one of the neighbors that there is no supervision because the trainers are not in the photos is misleading. Safety is always our number one priority. The opposition also presented a sound study. It did not take into account any actual data on captively bred tigers. It was based on a study that has no specific analysis of live tiger sounds. Mr. Guilford himself stated tigers, if they, they do not roar, if they do roar, only roar for three different reasons. When they take down large prey, our tigers are fed clean meat and chicken from the supermarket, so this could never happen. For romantic reasons, when they are in heat seeking a mate, and females calling to their young. Clearly, two and three are impossible because our animals are spayed, and we do not breed contrary to the information that was disseminated to the neighbors claiming that we breed. Our tigers were spayed as soon as it was safe to do so. If we ever obtained additional tigers, those would necessarily be spayed upon the first opportunity as well. We agree with the video shown by the opposition that extremely experienced professionals who follow strict protocol and regulations should be the only ones to breed. We completely agree that our time and energy should be spent against those who practice improper breeding practices and inbreed. Additionally, the sound studies presented was done based on the fact that a tiger would roar for 10 minutes every single hour. There is not one piece of evidence that this could ever even possibly occur. Further, no captive bred and raised tigers were used in this study. Every single expert that was asked by the county, including zoos, and every single animal expert agreed that in captivity, tigers do not give out these sounds. The experts agree that although tigers can give sound, out sounds as loud as a German shepherd, this is not typical and by no means constant. And there is absolutely no scientific evidence whatsoever that any tiger in captivity has ever made a sound that would make any person or animal paralyzed. In fact, every single ep expert said this was absolutely absurd, absurd. As far as the ambient noise, there are multiple large dogs barking constantly, ducks and roosters next door that make a lot of noise, much more than our tigers have or will ever exhibit. Additionally, the packs of coyotes produce very loud sounds regularly at the property. The sound steady that stated how quiet it was, should have taken all of that into account, but it did not. As far as lions, they are completely different animals with completely different social structures. They live in groups and call out to each other constantly. Tigers are solitary animals and do not have the same social system, so they will not exhibit similar behavior characteristics. They also have completely different vocalizations than tigers. Every expert will tell you you cannot compare the two. Since the last meeting, we hired a sound engineer to take measurements of our tigers and other animals at the facility they are currently in. Sorry. The results were submitted to the county and clearly showed that there were was far more noise from the wind, human speaking, and monkeys playing with their toys than from any of the tigers. Moreover, none of the noise exceeds any Ventura County requirements. During the study, one of the tigers was moved into the exercise pen, and we ran through a typical session. Later in the study, the tigers were fed their diet in their enclosure through the feed tube, as would occur on the property. As the engineer observed, the sound the tigers made were quieter than two people conversing. There will absolutely be no impact on any of the neighbors. We wish to emphasize that if our CUP application is approved, as we believe it should be, we will coordinate and work with building and safety as well as structural, a structural engineer to make sure that s extreme safety measures are in place when building this facility. Next. Additional state and federal agencies will inspect the project before any animals are brought in. 
we pride ourselves in our perfect record. We meet and exceed all rules, regulations, and safety requirements with absolutely no violations in order to maintain our permits and would never do anything to put them in jeopardy. Many in the community are supportive of the project but hesitate to speak out in fear of angering others. Another segment of the community was originally opposed, some to the point of protest, but upon learning of the facts, now support the project and some of those people are here in attendance. Additionally, I know that the opposition gave another letter from lions and tigers and bears at the last meeting. We spoke to them. They absolutely did not give another letter against us. In fact, they called staff prior to the first hearing after they had an opportunity to speak to us and ask that their original letter be removed from the letters against us. This is another example of misleading information that continues to be presented to this commission. On the other hand, Others may continue to question this, our CUP application, which is unfortunate and largely based on false and me misleading information and distortions, even attacking us personally and suggesting that we are somehow unfit or unqualified. Given our track record over many years, this is simply not borne out by the facts. A comment from the opposition that we would never live in a blockhouse is mean-spirited. Rather, we look forward to moving onto the property. Moreover, some letters in opposition, including from the American Humane and Congressman and others, were premised upon false information that we breed tigers, that we believe that they are tame and domesticated and have them as pets, or that we treat them poorly, all of which are completely untrue. Nevertheless, we would like to move forward by working with every neighbor to make sure that every possible concern is addressed, including as basic as visual appeal and as important as fear. We will do everything in our power to always be there to help everyone in the community that we can. We will also work tirelessly to alleviate any possible concerns that people may have. If we are granted this permit today, we would like to invite not only everyone on our side, but also everyone on the opposing side to come join us for dinner right here across the street at, a, at the Thai restaurant. Come meet us, speak to us, voice your concerns. We will address them one by one and we'll, we'll try to set up a proper permitted situation so that all of you who are willing and interested can meet our animals and see what we do and how we do it in an extremely safe environment. We would be happy to set up a properly permitted educational seminar for the neighbors and staff so that people can actually see the reality of what we do. Every single person who was opposed to us and has seen what we do has changed their opinion. So we would like to present that offer to anyone who is willing to just come look. You will see that our methodology of working with these animals creates an enriched, safe environment. You will see that they respond to calling their name. And conversely, if a stranger would approach, them when they are not with us, they retreat to the furthest possible spot of their enclosure by natural instinct. Again, we have seen our animals react in stressful situations and thus, due to conditioning, can better predict their behavior in stressful situations. We know that once people know the truth, you will welcome us and you will see that what good neighbors we are. It is in everyone's interest to work together. This creates a safer environment for all involved. We would like to end by extending our hand to each and every neighbor. Every single person opposing us has not met our animals, has not come to the property, and with the exception of one couple, has not even met us. Given the opportunity to meet with us, we are confident that those reservations will quickly move beyond them and appreciate why the CUP is properly approved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a break. Excuse me, Ann. I'm sorry. A question from Commissioner Dukas before we do that. Yes, 
I want to make sure that you see the um, disclosures that um, I made and that you've had a chance to look at it. And I'll, re I'll get your response after our break. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a break for 10 minutes. We'll continue afterwards. Okay, uh, continuing the meeting. Um, did we have any questions? I'm sure we have some questions. We'll wait till after we have the speakers finish up. Do we have a... Uh, can we have uh, Ms. Hauser come back up to the podium, please? Uh, Commissioner Duke has had a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know whether you need to refer to them or not, but could you um, tell me again how many houses are on the on your property at uh, at that address? We have one house and one guest house. And is the is the house the of uh, the cinder block construction? Yes. And it's about two thousand square feet. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then the guest house is the 1650? No, it's like 700. 700. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about the old house that's referenced in the listing at 1650. Uh, when the uh, property owner sold us the property, I believe he that was a previous uh, residence, and as far as he knew, once the new property was was signed off. Everything, you know, they came and inspected all the properties and everything was fine. We came to find out probably about a year ago somewhere. I, I don't know when exactly. Um, no, not less, probably six months ago. Um, that, that, they would li that the county would like us to remove the bathrooms from the uh, house that's 1650. We were planning to use it as a barn anyway. So that's what, as soon as we found out, that's exactly what we did. Okay, I am, I am not finding your testimony credible because that is the original house that's 1650, the new house is the 2000, and the guest house is the 700. What Mr. Baca told me was that there was a garage conversion or something and that had to be taken out? Absolutely, that is the, okay. Absolutely not. Please, please check on that, please. Yeah. As, as uh, pardon me, as the land use consultant, this is really my area, uh, partially to respond to. If you look at our site plan, there's several structures on the property. There's a main residence, which is the 2,000 square foot residence, which is the newest one. Uh, prior to that, there was a main residence designated on the property that was it now is a barn. That barn had a bathroom in it and may have been listed on Zillow as an additional residence. I don't know. That may be the difference that you're seeing. Have you had a chance to look at the listings that are Zillow, Trulia, Redfin? There are all of them, and some of them are for lease. The 1650 oh. was for lease. The 700 was for rent. I saw that. We didn't. That's okay, no you did have a chance to see no. that. Yeah. No, this we did. We didn't. Those listings are not from us. That's from the previous owner. None of those are from us. Of course, you bought. You bought. From, right. from the previous owner. I, 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 think I understand your property is not for sale. Right. Right. I think the confusion there may have been from what was originally, what was designated as the original uh, primary residence on the property. That is no longer the primary residence on the property. That structure still stands. It is a barn, and I believe there's a, there is a garage next to it, too. That is a garage and a barn now. And if you'll see the site plan from Jensen Design and Survey that was submitted as part of the application, that is accurate. Okay. And uh, do you recall my first question to you at the last hearing was how many houses were on the property when you purchased the property and you told me two? It, it's correct. There's a house and a guest house. And the garage and the barn. barn. Yeah. It was when always you to be purchased a... the property, how many old. houses were on the property and you said two. Right. And indeed, there were three. So okay, that's all I want to get. One, one, uh, you know, I reviewed the I reviewed the the uh, testimony from from you before, and you, 
I, ch I chased it down with Mr. Baca, and he said, no, it was because there was this uh, garage conversion, or now you're saying barn conversion. No garage conversion. Garage is garage, and Okay, moving moving on. Um, do you uh, do you state that this uh, is not your backyard? This uh, this latest thing. I think it's called Exhibit T. Is this Exhibit T? Have you had a chance to look at this over? Sure, I'll show it to you. Are you stating that th this is not your yard and these are not your tigers? Just talking about the Hollywood home. Which picture? Just talking about your Hollywood home. I believe you're referring to the Hollywood residence? No, Beverly Hills, I think. Which, which, which pictures, I'm sorry, but which specific picture are we talking about? Uh, the document isn't numbered. The, this, this is it, yeah. But there are pictures of a house, what it, it looks like perhaps at one time there I can't tell if it's a play surface. It looks like a big checkerboard. Uh, it depends which pi I'm sorry. It depends which picture specifically you're referring to. Okay. There are a series of them on these two pages in that document. Which ones? I'm sorry. Uh, one shows an aerial of a house that has, were they not provided this, this document? We have it right here. It was uh, uh, put Matt, on online. I don't, yesterday. okay. This one? Okay. Okay. Is that your, is that your home? Which one, with the top, the top? This? Oh, can they get a color copy? That's, that's a. Uh... Yes, that's your, is that your uh, I, this is probably. This one, but not this, not those. There we go. I think it'll be easier to see it in Thank color. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. I didn't. I wasn't aware that you didn't have a copy. Okay. Um, is is that your home? We don't have a swimming pool. So, but I think the one towards the left. We don't have a swimming pool in our home. So I see a swimming pool at the top of the thing. But I think the house to the left probably is our home. This is on the corner. Okay, well, it's pretty distinctive. Is that your home? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, uh, is but, there a cage no, in the backyard there? There is no cage currently in the backyard. There was a, ca there was a small kennel for a dog when the dog was a puppy. There is no, there is no cage in the backyard for so a, a big animal. So that, that was not to contain the tiger? Oh, no. Okay. Um, are the pictures below um, of that house, no. the interior of that house? No. Uh, moving on to the next page, are, is that the exterior of your house, those, pic those pictures? The uh, one uh, with the little swimming pool is, and the one where there's a dog with a frisbee, yes, the rest are not. Oh, uh, sorry. The one, uh, sorry, the one with the, no, the rest are, so, uh, yes, sorry, and the one with, with my daughter is, yes. They were all taken the same time. And the one with the shed in the back and the tiger and the dog playing with that same checkerboard, that's not your house? The shed. The second one this. in the middle? Yes. It is. Yes. Okay, so. Sorry. Uh, and yes. the one of your son in front of that same shed, that's not your house? That's my son, yeah. That's your house. Okay. So uh, five of those photos of you of yes. uh, five of those photos are of yes. your house. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Okay. Look, it's and <clears throat> uh, did your were they visiting? The it was tigers? like it was it was well a lot of them are the older tiger, which again we were completely allowed. I, I, I want to make it, I think there's a little bit of confusion. I think that you should just answer directly the questions that I am putting to you at this point. Okay. Uh, how did you secure the tigers when they weren't playing with the dog or the children? They were never housed there, ever. They were brought there on a couple of occasions, and we are allowed to bring and take our cats different places 
to socialize them. It is something How are they that was, secured otherwise it's, it's when fully, they are not playing with dogs or children? The property is fully fenced. We also have panels around everything when we're taking, when, when they are out like this, we have panels around everything in addition to a secondary level of yeah. full fencing completely around the entire thing. And in addition to that, they're all, well, they're on a leash, but that's, that's, it's completely secondary. There, it's fully, it's fully, fully fenced, and there's a d additional panels that we put up every single time. Um, are you aware of what's called a special events permit in, in Beverly Hills? We called Beverly Hills, and again, we spoke to Mr. Nestor Otazu just after the last meeting. Are you familiar with a special event permit? Yes. You are. Yes. And you were advised that you did not need Absolutely. a special event permit? Correct. Because they were not being housed? Correct. And we, and we weren't. We, so, weren't you could, so, so you could bring your tigers from the facility in Santa Clarita to your home in Beverly Hills without just, just uh, taking them from your truck and, and putting them in the backyard? First of all, they're babies uh, in every single Wait, picture. Wait, well, I'm sorry. Was the answer to that yes or no? When they are babies, we have completely different rules than when they are adults. It's a complete, I, I, I mean, I can't just answer yes or no because they're, it's completely different rules. So this, this photo of um, the boy, the dog, and the tiger, that's when the, do when the tiger was a baby? Yes. Three months. This one not, but this is a, if you look at, at my son's picture here, and him now, look how many years ago was that. And that, at that point, I, I don't have a problem with your son being in your backyard. No, I'm no, just I, asking I just about the tigers. That this was the oldest tiger that at was that over time. 10 years ago, and the rules were different at that time. At that time, it was six months old. That is a six-month-old yes, tiger. Absolutely. We have never taken an adult tiger uh, without uh, whatever. Absolutely. This is a six-month-old six month tiger. Yes. I see. Okay. Look Did at the, you look solicit at little min pin? It's not a Doberman next to it in the picture. It's a miniature pincher that's eight pounds. It's big. <laughs> okay. For that matter, the tiger playing with the little dog is that the miniature pincher? That's a yes. Miniature pincher. Okay. That's this not big. a Doberman. It's eight pound miniature pincher. Um. M uh, moving on, uh, this uh, Tim Harrison, Director of Outreach for Animals, did you solicit him to, to write a letter in your support? Uh, Tim Harrison is somebody that I met previously, and we, before we even got the property, he knew about our situation and about our cats, and we discussed the fact that we were looking for many years to find the property to house our cats. And at that time, we were, he was very much, you know, he made the movie Elephant in the Living Room, and we discussed different aspects of uh, how safely interact with them and what the rules and regulations are, and um, that was it. And then now when we have this situation, I contacted Tim Harrison, and I told him what our situation was and what we were planning to do. And he said that he would like to, he was going to be here on an original uh, meeting, but unfortunately he had a cancer surgery and he was not able to attend. Okay, so you are aware, so, so this isn't an unsolicited letter. You're aware of it yes. and, and, okay. And he says that these tigers have been housed in the, okay, he says, in his letter, to remove these animals from their accustomed care causes mental and physical trauma to the animal. And he says some other things too, but you say that the house, the tigers have been housed in Santa Clarita for 12 to 13 years. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Excuse me, uh, since we've changed speakers on uh, Commissioner Dukas' question, would you reintroduce yourself? And oh, uh, Sophia Krushek. I'm uh, Irina Hauser's partner at 11077 Pacific View Drive. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, his, his letter seems to um, contradict uh, 
he, he talks about how important it is for the big cats to stay where they are and not be moved, but they've been housed in Santa Clarita for 12 what, to 13 what years. What he means is to stay with their owners. He, he's talking about the fact that he was working very hard against private ownership, and what he's, that this is what he's referred to, that he understands that the cats have to be with their original owners that raised them. That's what he's referring to right there. How much time do you spend at the Santa Clarita facility? We're there at least every other day, and that's, uh, we spend minimum of an hour plus with each cat, socializing them, working them in an exercise area. Um, sometimes we spend more time depending on what's happening. Um, that's basically what it is. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, other questions? I have some questions. Uh, I'm assuming Ms. Hauser, but in any, any case, uh, I'm curious about uh, about uh, the feeding, uh, and not specifically the process. I want to know what they eat and how much they eat again, and I want to know what the process is of getting whatever their food supply is to the proposed site. Uh, their food is typically kept in freezers. It's typically uh, similar to exactly what you would see in store-bought food. Uh, they have a, a varied diet. So in other words, they'll have beef, then they'll have chicken uh, with special vitamins that are made for you know, zoological animals. And once a week, they have something called a zoologic diet. Um, and then uh, they also have special, um, you know, bones that are brought in for their teeth and stuff like that. Uh, it, it's varied every day because it would be varied typically, and that's what zoos and others have found to be a better way to give them a diet. It's fed through feed tubes. We never walk in to feed. No, I understand that. I get beyond that. Um, what, is, what is the facilities you have, or what do you have on-prem or you intend to have on-prem to contain those foodstuffs? That's why we're using the barn area. We're going to have several freezers full of food. We also have a generator in case power goes out or something like that to make sure that food is kept. Um, <coughs> and then, and then it's, you know, it's defrosted on a daily basis. It, 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 there's a process, basically, where it's defrosted on a daily basis for the next day. And... And there's, you know, how does that food get from the point of purchase to your proposed facility? Uh, we we pick it up. There's there's most of the wild animal. Well, not the, there are many wild animal facilities that go through this program, and I believe the wolf sanctuary is also part of that program. Um, and it's, you know, uh, you pick up the food once a week, and, and we also get uh, carnivore diet. Uh, we pick up, uh, it's f from one of the facilities. It's, it's delivered to one of the facilities, and then the food is picked up once a week. And did I hear you say it's delivered from its point of origin to uh, a facility? I, and then, yeah, and I'm, then I'm not sure specifically how it's delivered, uh, but, but all of the you know, wild animal compounds go to that particular, like we've picked up food how many do you, times. How do you anticipate it's going to be delivered? How, are, how do you anticipate it's going to get to the to location us, where we'll you're proposing? It, somebody, to, one of us will pick it up. And in what quantity are we talking about? Is uh, it a truck type, type situation? It's, or yeah, it's small. This, the, they eat, you're saying once a week. Yeah, they eat about 10 pounds a day. Okay. Oh yeah, pickup trucks e easily. They, uh, you mentioned generators and it was mentioned briefly in the proposed conditions of approval, um, but I hear nothing about the operation and backup and hours of operation on, on generators and stuff like that, which can become a noise factor in that type of environment. What, there's nothing in here on that. We have a generator for emergency only, and it's a Honda, which has is the quietest possible uh, generator, and, and it, it, the noise factor of that particular generator is below... Um, uh, and I can I can provide you with the actual information, but it's below 
what it, California, it's a special California requirement generator and it's made by Honda, which is the, as far as we were told as we were doing the research, that's the quietest possible generator. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, one of the things I noticed in one of the, uh, on the staff report, uh, our staff report under Exhibit 19A, uh, and I don't expect you to know what that is necessarily, but it's uh, page 226 of, a, of, of 821 pages. It's, I just took uh, one random copy of a, uh, what appears to be a Lake County inspection report uh, for a Victoria McMillan. Um, Animal Rentals United, or excuse me, Unlimited, uh, 31305 TikTok Canyon, uh, Canyon Country. Um, it's an inspection report. What's the significance of that as it relates to you? Uh, what, y what year was it? I'm sorry. Actually, it was 1987. Uh, we, uh, not, nothing. <laughs> We we had no. Who is who is Victoria McMillan? Uh, they used to own uh, the ranch where our tigers are currently housed. They no longer own that property. For years, or or the business. So it's not relevant to this. No. Okay. I noticed on your uh, your uh, uh, the safety plan uh, that was submitted. Uh, it appeared to be a cut and paste, uh, only in that the text was referring a couple of times to LA County uh, notification and facilities and that type of stuff. And I see a smile from from uh, your your sister there. So, um, so I assume that was somebody else's plan that you're, that's being adopted uh, for this proposal. We're we're using information from current plans. As well, we have to maintain our safety plan because of our federal and state licenses. We have to maintain it to be relevant to the facility they're currently at because that was a requirement. And we just had reapproval for, for our fishing game and all that stuff. We had to make sure that that's relevant to that facility as well. So that's not your actual formal plan? That's, a, that's your proposed plan? Is that what I hear you saying? Correct. And once we're on the property, you know, it, it, until you build something on the property, you also have to figure out what the best location, you know, as you're building, depending on what building and safety, what, what they require and what things they are going to want. Obviously, we ha we're going to have to work with, all, you know, staff and, and make sure that our safety plan also coordinates with what they're requiring as well. Okay. Um, on a companion page, um, Exhibit, six, exhibit uh, 21 of the staff report is a single page that I identified here. Uh, uh, it, it lists a, the, number, the people that are be not, to be notified in case of emergency evacuation and that type of stuff, a variety of people, um, including the, the Macmillans, looks like. Um, are they still in business? Um, are they still in the in the trade? They are. Uh, for they notification are purposes. In the trade. And I also see a list of evacuation points, uh, compounds, and locations, um, sorted by distance, and they're all in L.A. County. Um, the New Hall, you know, Canyon Country area. Um, is this is part of what I was referring to? Is is that where the animals are going to be moved to if there is a need to move them off prem? It it really depends on where the specific, if what specific situation it is. We've also since spoken to um, Steve Martin, who is who has the facility in the area, and our evacuation plan will be updated. We we can't update it until we actually have our cats there for for fishing game and for USDA. But it will be updated for Ventura County once the cats are are going to the Ventura County property. Okay. It seemed to me, just personal observation, it seems to me that, that the plan ought to be in place before occupancy occurs and amended after the fact. 
um, as a opposed to a, new a proposal for us to consider as isn't part it, of this process. It, isn't there a new, um, the new plan? Does it's just it's, it's a personal observation. The, the, can, if, if I could speak to that, this, the safety plan, there's two versions actually of it. There was one that was revised already for Ventura County, yeah. and um, staff, I believe, has placed a condition that prior to a zoning clearance, um, the safety plan will have to be updated pursuant to sheriffs, fires, all the other agency regulations. Right, I read that. Yeah. Okay. But the new um, one, I think, has Steve Martin's facility in there as well. I, b I believe it does. I'm and sorry, I didn't hear the comment. So I believe the new plan that we had submitted has Steve Martin's facility in there as well. Okay. Um, as I read the report, uh, number of locations, we t we're concerned about the obviously the enclosure and the and the, uh, the wiring, and several places throughout the report, I, I saw an exchange of of uh, description between six gauge and seven gauge. It, there was no. There was contradictions, I, and I, I certainly don't know why, but it appears there's a difference between 6-gauge and 7-gauge. Is we're that just a typo? Or is we're that required, it must be. Uh, we're required to have 9-gauge. Uh, 6-gauge wire is uh, significantly stronger than 9-gauge wire. So as you go down in gauges, it's every, every gauge is significantly stronger. We are going to use only six gauge wire for all of their enclosures. Okay, thank you. And that's what we use now. Okay, that's all I have. Questions I have. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then moving on to the, other, the remaining speaker cards. Um, uh, Andrew Guilford. Did she return? Lori. Were, the, were those papers returned? Okay. I forgot to ask her a question. Can we you can go ahead and proceed. Uh, uh, good morning, Chair Rodriguez and Commissioners. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Andrew Guilford, and I represent the Blue Wave Trust, which owns the property located at 10995 Pacific View Road, which is next door to the proposed Tiger facility. Um, before I start, I want to uh, also thank the uh, planning division, um, Ms. Prillhart, Mr. Baca, and Mr. Dobrowski for all of their time and effort, um, as well as your commission for all of your time and effort on behalf of this issue. Um, we support staff's recommendation to deny the CUP application, um, and we'd like to make just a few brief comments addressing some of the points touched on by the applicant today. Uh, before I get started, just as a pre preliminary matter, the applicant referred to me, I believe, uh, discussing the circumstances under which tigers roar. I, I don't have that knowledge. It was not me who made those comments at the last hearing, so please don't ask me about the circumstances under which tigers roar. Um, we strongly support the staff's determination that the housing of tigers in the Deer Creek community is not compatible with the surrounding development. The housing of these animals is more appropriate in a less populated, less dense rural area. There are 28 residents, uh, residences within just one half mile of the proposed Tiger facility. And as you heard today, as well as on February 13, these residences are the homes of families with children, retire retirees and elderly, among others. By contrast, the Lockwood facility, at the time of permitting, which I believe is in 1987, had just four residences within a half mile of the facility. Uh, and even those four residence, residences, as shown, were on the outskirts of that one half mile radius. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. Lockwood Valley facility, what are you referring to, the, the dog hybrids? We're referring to the Steve Martin 
facility. Steve that, Martin. Okay, yes, thank you. that has been a point of comparison. Uh, the staff report addresses the current density at, at Lockwood, and um, e this is 27 years after that facility was permitted. Uh, but even using the current density, the staff correctly determines that Lockwood is a more suitable site for a Tiger facility than would be Deer Creek. Confirming the lack of compatibility, as you've heard, the neighbors in the community are uniformly opposed to this development. And the opposition is not limited to those in the immediate neighborhood as we submitted um, in connection with the prior hearing, more than 11,000 Ventura County residents have signed petition in opposition to this proposed project. The staff also correctly noted the adverse impact of a Tiger facility on the two year-round camps in the area. Representatives of both camps were present at the February 13 hearing and firmly opposed this project. In contrast to the Boy Scout camp, uh, nearby to the Lockwood facility where they had no such opposition. Now, in addition to what staff has addressed, the proposed Tiger facility would be incompatible with the surrounding development in several other respects. We have now learned that the applicant proposes to place a roof over the entire caged facility. And essentially, and you've also heard testimony from residents that this property is in their line of sight. So essentially what we're going to have now is a giant in chain link enclosure on this property creating an eyesore for the community. Similarly, similarly, also on this issue of what's this going to look like to the surrounding development, presumably this facility will be lit up at night, also creating an eyesore for the facility, for the community. You've heard as well that the proposed Tiger facility will have other impacts on the uh, surrounding community. Um, for example, insurance exclusions will be uh, triggered in the event that the Tigers do escape and cause damage to persons or property. It appears that the neighbors would have no insurance as a result. Tiger facility is also incompatible with the surrounding development for additional reasons. Um, we've addressed concerns raised by fires in the community and the concerns about evacuating the Tigers, particularly in a situation where you have one person located on the property. Recently, there was a rainstorm, and I understand um, recently there were also, uh, that resulted in power outages for significant periods of time. I understand there were also power outages just recently for whatever reason in the Deer Creek area. And there is no plan associated with what happens in the event that there is a power outage and the, um, the tigers have to be evacuated. The um, proponent, the applicant proposes reverse 911 as a potential for alerting the neighbors in the event of an emergency. But one of the issues that hasn't been covered in Deer Creek is the fact that there is very limited to no cell phone coverage, which um, obviously impacts the value of a reverse 911 to the neighbors. Similarly, there are issues with connectivity such as Wi-Fi which would impact the ability to monitor, monitor these tigers to the extent that there's a proposal to have security ca cameras and any off-site monitoring of those security cameras. We've also discussed the terrain um, of the Deer Creek area. And in contrast to the um, Lockwood facility, which is on flat ground and accessible by a long straight road, the Deer Creek uh, area is only accessible by a long winding road coming up from PCH, which causes significant challenges, not just for transporting the Tigers, but in the event of the need to evacuate in an emergency situation and the event to, of needing to access the site. The Deer Creek community we'd submit is just simply not suitable and not compatible for the proposed development. Staff has also correctly found that the proposed project would be detrimental to the public interest, health, safety, convenience, or welfare. 
as stated by the staff, regardless of the conditions of approval imposed on a project, the potential for human error resulting in the release of a dangerous animal will always remain. And we submit that this potential for human error is particularly an issue here. What the applicant said on February 13 and what's been repeated here is that it's very important to understand that these tigers are not pets, that these are wild animals and that safety is our number one priority and that we are always cognizant of the fact that these are wild animals and not pets. But the photographs that we've shown tell a different story. Uh, the tigers are in fact handled just like pets and treated just like pets by the applicant and her family. And there was some discussion previously about these photographs and an acknowledgement by the applicant that these are her tigers and her family. Now still on the issue of human error, we understood the applicant's position to be that there is no direct human contact between the tigers and uh, others except for the trainers. But again, that's not what the photographs show. Um, this is a photograph of an author, um, Colleen Hawk, um, who wrote on her web page about how she was allowed to pet and hand feed meat to the applicant's tiger while the, quote, trainer, end quote, looked on. It's not correct that the tigers are limited in their contact with humans to just the trainer. Um, and it's not correct that the applicant treats these tigers as the wild animals that they are as opposed to just pets. Now, we heard from a trainer associated with Hollywood animals that the applicant and her sister were trained at Hollywood animals. And Chair Rodriguez, we previously submitted safety reports and inspections for the Hollywood Animals facility showing, as we discussed on February 13, that Hollywood Animals received a grade B due to a concern about the safety of the tiger enclosures. I believe you may have pulled one of those sheets, uh, perhaps, in the submittal, which was just meant to be a complete submittal of all the documents that had been received. Yes, uh, in response to you, yeah, that was identified as Exhibit 20 Thank you. in the staff report. Now, in written submittals, we showed that the Hollywood Animals training was an eight-day course for which there were no formal prerequisites. We also showed in prior submittals, submittals that the applicant and her sister state that their safety plan is the same as the Hollywood Animals safety plan, perhaps explaining the cut and paste that um, Chair Rodriguez, you referred to. So we want to talk just briefly about Hollywood Animals and, and their safety plan. On February 13, we showed these photographs of individuals at Hollywood Animals walking tigers on leashes outside of the Hollywood Animals enclosure on a public road. Unfortunately, the photographs were in black and white, I believe. We've now submitted color photographs, and they are on the screen as well. Here recently is a Hollywood Animals trainer who is walking a wild animal in Runyon Park. Um, she says, took this little lady on a hike today. Um, it appears she has a leash down below. You'll see she um, comments with emoticons, dog plus leopard equals death, which I think, think kind of says it all about the approach to safety. Here are more, more photographs of the Hollywood animals trainers taking their tigers off-site into public parks on leashes. And here is what appears to be a lion from Hollywood animals off-leash in a public park. Now, Hollywood animals like the applicant, allows for human contact between members of the public and the wild animals. Here is a member of the public petting a tiger at Hollywood Animals, or a Hollywood Animals tiger. And here is a member of the public 
feeding a marshmallow to a bear, a Hollywood animal's bear. This is the basis for the training that's received by, that was received by the applicant and her sister. Uh, we submitted photographs of the tigers um, at the Beverly Hills home of the applicant. Um, I think there was some question of, at first about whether this was in fact the home of the applicant, but I believe the applicant now acknowledges that yes, indeed, this is the home. Um, we made contact with uh, Nestor Tuza with City of Beverly Hills and um, were informed that there were no permits that were pulled for bringing tigers into the Beverly Hills home. I believe the explanation for that was that 10 years ago things were different. Uh, we did not hear that and we did not hear that same story and find it difficult to believe that you can simply transport a wild animal to a new location without approvals or permits for doing so. Nevertheless, no permits located by the city of Beverly Hills. We were asked to contact the special events department with the city of Beverly Hills. No permits issued. And similarly, no permits issued by the city of Los Angeles. Now, the um, February at the February 13 hearing, we heard from many speakers on behalf of applicant, the applicant that they met the Tigers at a North Hollywood location. And it's our understanding that this is a North Hollywood warehouse. Um, this, these are photographs of the Tigers in the warehouse in North Hollywood. And this is a photograph of the North Hollywood warehouse itself. Similarly, for the city of Los Angeles, no permits were obtained according to the city of Los Angeles Animal Services Department for the keeping of the tigers in the North Hollywood, Hollywood warehouse. They could not be located in the name of the applicant, her sister, or ISIS preservation. Now the potential for human error that staff has identified is exacerbated here by the questions raised by the commission concerning who are the trainers of the tigers. We've heard that there are six adult members of the applicants and the sister's family and that those are the folks who will be responsible for the Tigers. Only two, uh, according to the submittals by the applicant, have ever received any training to handle the Tigers. The other four members of the family, their sole qualification to handle the Tigers is simply that they've been brought up around humans. The Tigers have been brought up around those members of the family. No information has been provided as to the qualifications, availability, or interest of the other four family members to care for the tigers. The potential for human error is also exacerbated in the event of an emergency. What was said on February 13 is that there will always be one person at the property. However, at least two people are required to handle and transport the tigers. So what was said on February 13 is in the event of an emergency, well, we'll wait for a second person or somebody to get there, which of course poses serious problems in the event of an emergency, particularly because of the isolated area of Deer Creek where access through this long, narrow road is difficult and time consuming, particularly if you're coming from Beverly Hills. Now, adding to the confusion of who's going to be responsible here is the fact that the permit owner is not the applicant. Also, the property owner is not the applicant, rather it's Wild Ones LLC, um, and we've submitted the information um, Commissioner Adukas that um, we discussed last time that reflects that the current property owner is Wild Ones LLC. Now, uh, just lastly on this topic of human error and then I'll wrap up. The applicant proclaims that we leave no room for human error and let's put aside the irony of a human saying that there is no room for human error. Every facility believes it cannot happen to me. 
It will not happen to me until it happens. As we showed in the photographs, they demonstrate that the applicant does not handle the tires in a manner that reflects that they're cognizant of the fact that these are wild animals as opposed to pets. The tigers are treated as pets. Um, tragically, here, um, the, there's a connection to um, an event at what is called Wildcat Haven. We submitted this information. It's our understanding that the applicant's sister was the head trainer at Wildcat Haven for five years, and just recently, there was a tragic mauling and death at that facility. So it can and it does happen. There's a long list of people and groups that are opposed to this application. We've discussed the uniform opposition of the neighbors. We've discussed the 11,000 plus county residents that oppose this project. In addition, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, Congressperson Buck McKeon, Assemblyperson Jeff Gorell, Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky, the Humane Society, PETA, Tippi Hedren, all oppose the keeping of the tigers in Deer Creek. We respectfully submit that the Commission should adopt the staff's recommendation and deny the application for CUP. Any questions of the speaker? Thank you. Very I have much. one question. Yes. Um, in the letter that uh, the commission received from uh, Mr. Bradbury, he indicated there was new information or additional information. I assume the new whatever uh, it was is covered. You covered. I've covered it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Conte. Thank you, Chairman Rodriguez, members uh, of the commission. Um, my name is Charles Coate. I'm here on behalf of the applicants. The determination um, before you is governed by Section 8181.35 of the Coastal Zoning Ordinance. If this commission makes a determination on the facts before it, as opposed to the prejudice before it, and ignores hearsay and relies upon facts, it will vote to approve this CUP. The staff report, uh, which has been submitted to I'm you. I'm sorry, could you repeat 8181 what? Section 8181-3-5. Thank you. In the February 13th, uh, 2004 staff report at page 15, the report indicates that the proposed keeping of wild animals in secure enclosures and in a fenced area less than one-third of an acre would have no discernible physical effect on the neighboring land uses. I appreciate uh, one of the commissioner's acknowledgement earlier in comments and her recognition that this is a remote area. This is not a heavily populated area. It borders a state park on one side and borders farmland on another side. Two principal bases were asserted in recommending denial of the CUP in the report. One was under section 8181 35C that the CUP application was not compatible with surrounding development. That the keeping of wild animals was more appropriate in a remote rural area with less population. This is a remote rural area that is not densely populated in any sense. The PowerPoint presentation that was uh, made to the attention of the council before the break indicated that there are 19 residences surrounding the Martin facility that the county of Ventura has permitted them to house up to 100 wild animals. 
this area, there's evidence of 28 residences within that area, knowing that the 19-acre uh, parcel, which is quite large, on one side is bordered by wilderness and a state park, and on the other side by farmland. It would be arbitrary and capricious for this commission to find that one part of the county could accommodate 100 wild animals in a uh, in relation to 28 here uh, in terms of uh, density when density actually per animal and the permit that has uh, uh, already been approved actually allows for many more wild animals to be held in proximity to uh, many more people at the existing facility. In other words, is there a different standard governing this part of Ventura County than another? There should not be. <clears throat> the other bases, which was cited by uh, council for the opposition was a citation in the staff report that given the mere potential for human error that this application should be denied. That is an impossible standard for anyone to meet. In fact, the report that's been submitted to the commission found it is not reasonably foreseeable that the tigers would escape. I'm sure the commission understands the import of a finding by the staff of what not reasonably foreseeable means notwithstanding the recommendation by that staff that there is not a reasonable, uh, that it is not reasonably foreseeable that these tigers would escape. On the mere potential for human error, they said there's the potential for human error resulting in the release of a dangerous animal that will always remain. These are animals that were born in captivity, have been fed by handlers their entire life. The surrounding wilderness has mountain lions, bobcats, other animals that do in fact hunt for their food and can pose a real and actual danger that's not to say that these animals uh, are not wild, but they are in captivity, and they have been held in captivity their entire life. And the fact remains that the report that has been submitted to you has found it is not reasonably foreseeable that they will escape. Because they're born in captivity, they do not hunt for their food, unlike the surrounding coyotes and mountain lions that exist in the wilderness in this area. And although the commission has reflected a concern that we focus on the matters at hand, it is relevant to this application process 
to know that one of the principal opponents, a neighbor, sought to purchase this very property and that a financial interest may be what's driving this opposition apart, separate, and having nothing to do with the application before you. With regard to issues of sound, the report, uh, the, the staff report basically indicated that there were uh, no findings or no report on which uh, the commission could base any findings on. Uh, the applicants have indicated that uh, the sound is, is akin to a, a German Shepherd dog. The animals are spayed. They're not breeding. So two of the three uh, times in which the tiger will make a sound are not present here under these circumstances. And we're talking about a 19-acre parcel, and on the back part of it, where the CUP is seeking to build the enclosure. They have successfully operated a facility for many years without incident. And although a number of, of photos uh, have been flashed, many of them were not of the applicants, were of third parties, uh, and were taken out of context. If an animal is effectively an infant, three to six months, they may look large in the photos, but the fact is that they're not an adult grown tiger, and those photos were taken many, many years ago and are of little, if any, relevance here. Quickly, with regard to issues of insurance, uh, I'm informed that they have a separate uh, uh, insurance policy for uh, wild animals, uh, that they have plans for cell, cell phone repeaters throughout the property to enhance cell phone res reception, and that uh, they hold phones from different carriers, which provides an, an overlay of safety such that if you were not able to get a signal with one carrier, you would be able to get a signal with a different carrier. As far as the windy roads, um, the prior uh, submission made it clear that the uh, animals are transported in um, modified secured pickup trucks, which are clearly up to the task of driving uh, on these roads, unlike uh, horse trailers, which are much more difficult in that type of uh, winding terrain and which are not utilized. With regard to the uh, claim about it would be impossible to meet an emergency, uh, I believe that what's before you uh, does have uh, fail-safe plans for a shelter in place um, in the event of a natural emergency. But again, all of the residents in this area face possible emergency with regard to mountain lions and other indigenous animals in the event of fire, etc. Finally, um, the submission and citation to comments from people like a congressman that doesn't even reside in this district or uh, an L.A. County supervisor who obviously has no problem 
with their maintaining a facility in his own county, but apparently has a problem doing it in someone else's county, has no relevance to what's before you. I understand that it's sometimes difficult to um, concentrate on the facts and put prejudice aside, but this is a very sound plan. This is a very appropriate place for these animals uh, to be housed. And I would ask that the council, upon reflection on the facts and not the prejudice, would properly approve this CUP. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, uh, Commissioner Dukas. Could you clarify that Mr. thing about Coach. cell phone repeaters? Could I defer? No, but you're the one who said it. Could you just repeat exactly what you said again about cell phone repeaters? I was informed that they have an intention to place repeaters, which I understand are uh, antenna amplifiers, if you will, throughout the property to enhance cell phone reception. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Questions of staff? The clarification or anything? If I may, Mr. Chair, I think staff's going to respond to this anyway, but uh, the issue of the significant evidence as far as a secret requirement, did staff see that? I did not. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the commission, uh, we have some very brief comments uh, regarding the, uh, the, so. the issues here at the end. Um, uh, first, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, visual impacts. Uh, I'm going to talk about the issue that uh, Commissioner Idukas raised about the violations on the property. And then I'm going to talk about uh, vibrations and noise. Uh, in terms of uh, the visual impacts, uh, there's no night lighting included in the project. So they would not have any night lighting other than what an, anyone could have uh, as a ministerial act at a single family uh, dwelling location. Um, there was an issue about the, the roof and that somehow that would create some kind of uh, visual impact. Well, the, the site really can't be seen from a public viewing place. It can be seen from the neighbor's property, but uh, private views are not protected under any ordinance or under CEQA. You uh, can see the site, but it's quite remote from the street. But Commissioner Idukas. I, I understand from the, from the street, but um, from the trail, you can see the site. From Serrano Valley Trail, you can see the site. So how was it determined that there was no public well, viewing uh, of the site? Let me, let me back up. Uh, it's not readily visible, and the trail is quite a, quite a distance from the site. And so looking at fences over that distance, uh, which are not actually structures or buildings, uh, like chain link fence, uh, is, is not a prominent site from the trail distance. Now, it's up to your commission uh, whether that's uh, incorrect judgment. But let me, may I continue? Uh, the issue about uh, how many residences are on the site, um, I believe when the applicant purchased uh, the property, uh, there are three buildings that uh, the county would consider to be residences. When we uh, visited the site as part of our review of this application, uh, it became apparent that one of the buildings was uh, illegally converted to a third residence. Uh, the, uh, the issues there had been abated and the bathroom removed, and, uh, and the only thing left to, uh, to take care of is to remove a kitchen facility in that building, which is really pending this application. We allowed it to remain until uh, your commission or the county decision makers made a decision on this application because it's part of the permit that they would use that building and kitchen uh, to store and cook the uh, animal food, which according to environmental health cannot be cooked in the same facility as human food is being cooked. So that's the answer on the violations. And then there's uh, the issue of noise. Uh, I, I would tell your commission uh, that uh, more important than our opinion and recommendation uh, on what your decision should be uh, a more important job that we have is to make sure that your commission receives uh, accurate and adequate information upon which to base your decision. Uh, as a professional geologist, uh, on another case, I could stand up before you at the microphone and say, this slope is stable. And that's an interesting conclusionary statement, but it doesn't mean anything unless you've provided the data and a report to back up what you've just said that allows it to be peer-reviewed. And so... Uh, 
uh, you know, Mr. Um, Hale uh, said he concurred with my critique. Well, my critique concludes that his report is inadequate and, and not, is not adequate for county use in the planning process because it has all kinds of gaps in it. Uh, he's chosen not to provide a report. Uh, he uh, provided some evidence or some testimony today, which is the same as a conclusionary statement that I've modeled it and it violates noise standards. I would point out that uh, Dr. Hale's report includes all kinds of analysis of various circumstances, uh, instantaneous noise events like a single Yelp and, and how far that would go, which are irrelevant to the county and our analysis both under policy and under CEQA. We have a one hour average noise standard, LEQ one hour standard, that does not involve instantaneous noises. So an instantaneous noise at, a, at 120 dB is, is not relevant to us. The issue is duration. And the report as it sits here today uh, still does not include uh, any information about uh, and justification really for the noise levels for growling, moaning, and roaring. There's no justification for those noise levels. And there's no statement in there in the report as to what duration of those various noises were used. He testified that he used 10 minutes uh, at the last hearing, and there's no evidence to support that we can find to support that there's going to be 10 minutes of roaring uh, on average of any hour uh, of the day. And so uh, I, I would point out that, um, you know, he, uh, uh, he has not provided the parameters and the data that we could evaluate it. And I think that's particularly important when you have a report titled uh, Opposition to Tiger Facility that you need to support your data. Uh, he uh, also contradicted his, his report in his testimony here today. Uh, and um, I, I have his report, and this is uh, the report dated uh, uh, February 11th, 2014, um, you know, submitted to your commission on the day before the hearing, uh, at, on the February 13th hearing, entitled Opposition to Proposed Outdoor Tiger Facility. And in there, he talks about, uh, and I'm just going to read this, it's very short, uh, the human hearing system is not equally sensitive to, uh, to sound at all frequencies. Because of this variability, a frequency-dependent adjustment called A weighting has been devised by scientists so that the sound may be measured in a manner similar to the human hearing system. Uh, the A weighted sound level is abbreviated DBA. Uh, and so uh, the DBA, uh, Dr. Hale testified today that DBA is a distance-related uh, phenomenon. Well, that's not consistent with what he says in his own report. Uh, a weighting has to do with the human hearing range, and sounds that are below or above our hearing range are not counted as noise that we detect and, and feel as impacts. So, uh, so we've received inconsistent testimony today with his own written work. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to um, uh, read, uh, which I often do at at uh, these hearings, uh, my favorite section of the blue book. That would be the California Environmental Quality Act, the CEQA guidelines. And this is section 15064F5. It says, argument, speculation, unsubstantiated opinion or narrative, or evidence that is not, that is clearly inaccurate or erroneous, or evidence that is not credible, shall not constitute substantial evidence. Substantial evidence shall include facts, reasonable assumption predicated upon facts, and expert opinion supported by facts. And you may have received expert opinion, but it's not supported by facts. And so it does not constitute substantial evidence uh, of an impact uh, or an exceedance of county noise threshold standards. And uh, so uh, I think that uh, what's before you today is, is there's no substantial evidence of a, a noise impact and there's no substantial evidence that there's an exceedance of county threshold policies. Uh, my director has uh, further comments. I just wanted to, to, to share a little bit of my uh, perspective with this, of having uh, lived with it for as long as I have. I mean, I first want to, to thank the applicant, Ms. Hauser, and their um, consultant, Jensen Design. They really have been a good applicant. They have done everything that the county has requested that they do through this entire process. So the decision to make a recommendation for denial was, was difficult 
We don't do that very often here at the county because typically we have an opportunity to, to work through issues um, with our applicants. But I did, I did just want to, to put that on the record. Um, I want to get to the issue very quickly of the safety plan. Um, in, on page 17 of 24 that uh, Chair Rodriguez raised, we said, if an animal keeping uh, permit is granted, a revised safety plan that reflects the scope of any approval will be required to be developed by the applicant and approved by the above listed agencies prior to inauguration of the proposed use. And, and so, you know, we have to weigh the money that the applicant is spending to prepare a plan and, and gather the fire protection district and animal services and the sheriff office and, Nash and the, the environmental health and planning and the park services, which we would do if the process was approved. Right, so I just wanted to say that we, we did look at that, we did acknowledge that it was deficient in, in certain ways and that it would require a really robust review, but I wasn't really willing to, to make them go through that process because I wasn't sure of, of the outcome of that. And it would also depend on the number of animals if they were granted the permit. So um, we do have that, the, the safety plan is a requirement. Um, condition 23, which is on page 16. So I, I, I do wanna let you know that we have that issue covered. The, the, the things that went into to my recommendation for denial have, have all been discussed here today, have all been discussed um, in the staff report. We used um, Steve Martin, and I'm, I'm sure that, that that analysis had its flaws as well. But, you know, the, the, the testimony or what I found compelling was a, was a few different things. Clearly, the, the um, wildfire that we just had, Camarillo Springs, in my drive up there, right, how close it got. The fact that you know there could be a potential for for 57 lots, the the density of of it, and and really the fact that um, these camps that have existed out there since 1952, with thousands of children right in the vicinity, all all played a role in my recommendation for denial. But that being said, I don't have the ability, or I don't have the um, the the 10 hours of testimony right that you had either i had what was on the written record so you know based on you know there was arguments made both sides right that i that i think that um i don't have that benefit when i make my recommendation so i wanted to put that on the record as well i want to also talk about the difference between CEQA findings the california environmental equality act findings that we make versus the conditional use permit findings. So I believe that the CEQA document, as it stands, and, and I didn't hear substantial evidence to that today, um, is, is satisfactory. That's impact on the environment. That is, what does the impact of putting, putting five tigers in the open space area have on air quality, have on biology, have on roads, right? That's what that's discussing. Versus an equally important set of findings that you have to make for a conditional use permit. That talks about public safety, public health, safety, and welfare. It talks about land use compatibility, those kind of findings that we have to make. So you have to make both sets. So I think we made the CEQA findings in the applicant's favor, and the uh, public health and safety and the land use compatibility findings are what I struggled with, is which I, what, I, what I put on the record today. I would also say that I mean, probably no matter which way that, that your commission goes, I think that there should be some consideration that if we would say, if you, you know, the, the, the coastal zoning ordinance mentions wild animals in the matrix only, yes, you're allowed to apply for them in the open space zone, and then it says no more, right? So I think that, you know, regardless if we're to, to move forward or not, the recommendation that I asked in both sets of recommended, recommended actions, which I wrote up for you um, to approve or deny, would be to that the planning staff ask the Board of Supervisors whether specific standards for the keeping of wild animals should be developed for inclusion into the Coastal Zoning Ordinance, because I do think it's a little um, unfair that both the staff and the applicant have to weigh this with no standards. So there isn't a standard to say, if you're over 20 acres, right? If you back up to the national forest, if you're within five miles from a camp, right? So um, none of those standards are there for us to, to, to review. So, um, you know, that's, that's just what we had to, to go with based on all of the written testimony that I was received, that was received and that I did read through um, before I made my recommendations. So I just wanted to share my thoughts with you before you went forward. 
thank you. I uh, I see a representative from the sheriff's department here, and uh, there's been a lot of talk about communications and that type of thing. I'd like to call Commander Stewart up to the podium. Good morning. Thought you were going to get away. I huh? thought I was. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's been a long time since I uh, since, I, since I was in a patrol car with the sheriff's department, but. I certainly remember issues of communications, and we used to go 10-6 below the rock, meaning that we we're going south below Magoo Rock, um, and the difficulty of communications, radio communications there. I know it's improved in the past. Can you give me an update on how it is now? Yeah, with the new improvements in the radio system, um, uh, we have excellent radio communication down there, um, unlike it was in the 70s and 80s where you had no uh, communication. Um, all my patrol staff tells me that they have no problem accessing dispatch from any of the areas. Um, cell phone coverage is a, is a little uh, a little more challenging and spotty in, in certain areas. I was referring to the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> Been back in the 60s too, so um, it didn't change much until, yeah, uh, okay, until a few okay. years ago. Yeah, I know if we didn't come back in half an hour, somebody went looking for us. Um, Tell me about the uh, the capabilities of reverse 911, um, both on cell phone and landline. Yeah, we have the ability with VC Alert. Um, if people from the community want to register for VC Alert, they can get automatic updates whenever we send out any kind of a reverse 911. But we can also um, um, set up essentially a, uh, a fence around that area. And if we were notified, if dispatch was notified of, of an escape situation, um, it could automatically be sent out to a pre-designated um, residences in the area to notify them of the situation and to provide them direction on what they should do, whether it's to shelter in place um, or to evacuate the area, depending on what, what the emergency was. So they would contact the Sheriff's Department and register their telephones? Uh, both they can register their cell phones. If it's a landline, we can actually um, um, we can uh, geobase that area and set up our own parameters and have it already ready to go as soon as the phone call comes in. And, and that uh, information could be sent out almost instantaneous to us receiving the phone call. Thank you. So you send the phone call out, but if somebody has you know, their cell phone and their cell phone there is very spotty. How does that work then? Well, you make the call. How does the person receive the call? Well, again, if it's a landline. No, um, if it's if, it, if it's if cell. it's a cell phone, it depends on whether or not they're going to receive service or not. Okay, so if you do not receive service and service is very spotty there, I couldn't I couldn't have my Sprint phone work wherever I went in that area. Um, what happens then? then you will probably not receive the message until later once it's left on your uh, your voicemail. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions? Thank you. I have questions. Question uh, for staff from Commissioner Dukas. Um, have you had a chance to, to look over those things and see that that, um, that uh, 1650 square foot what you were saying was a before you said garage or that's what I remembered but now you're saying it's a, it was a barn um, uh, mr. chair Commissioner Idukas, uh, uh my, perhaps Jay has more commentary on that but my understanding is that there were three buildings and um, and like the real estate ad they would uh, the average person would say those are three dwelling units and um, and when we came to the site, uh, we said you can't have three dwelling units, and so uh, the bathroom and various other domestic fixtures were removed from one of the buildings. It's going to be used for either storage, should their permit be denied, or if their permit is granted, it would be part of the permit, and they'd be allowed to store and uh, prepare uh, cat food. I heard what you said. Yeah. I asked you if you looked at that paperwork. Uh, only briefly. Okay. Could you bring up pictures of the uh, of the staff report? You have pictures of of where the um, photographs from your staff report. Can you bring them back up? Those for PowerPoint presentation. PowerPoint presentation. I I misspoke. I don't know if we have that loaded. Okay. 
Um, while that goes, let me ask some other questions. One of the things um, where, where does the tiger poop go? Somebody uh, said that the, the amount of, uh, of waste was underestimated and uh, they said that waste management doesn't accept it. Currently, there was stuff in the in the staff report that said that it's taken at Sunshine Can in uh, Silmar for for the proposed facility. Where would that waste go? Okay. Go ahead, Jay. If you've got it. Uh, we're, we're looking in the volume of material here. We have a manure management plan, and so we're, we're looking for that. My Sorry. Re my recollection says that waste it was be contained, picked up immediately as soon as practical, and, and bagged or contained on prem until uh, it was picked up by waste management on a weekly basis. So, but but it, we it's also exhibit have five of your of your staff report. Okay, and we also have testimony that says waste management doesn't accept. That, that waste, is that, is that just a... Uh, there, there are facilities that accept waste. I, I know this from a case that I worked on in Santa Barbara County, where, and, and of course, uh, horse manure is another uh, large uh, volume of, of waste that is taken regularly. So there are places that take it. Understand. Legal I have places. a little bit of background in, in waste management and mm -hmm. uh, experience with regard to Sunshine Canyon, and, and uh, they, they cannot except this waste because it is out of county. That's where currently the, uh, the tiger's waste is, is going. But once it moves out of Ventura County, Sunshine has a, a limitation on where they take waste from. So we also have uh, information in our packet that says waste management doesn't take it. Is that not correct? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Is the answer the environmental health looked over the manure management plan and found this to be acceptable? So uh, I'm not. I think that we can find the answer to that. Okay, yeah. and, but they, and horse manure is entirely different than uh, tiger manure. Okay, let us look. Isn't this great? <laughs> Don't you love this? Anyway, um, there were some other questions that I had uh, about the location of the Hauser's property and how close it is to the trailhead, because I think it's like less than a thousand feet. And there's also a photograph that was submitted by Mary Cummins that shows um, the view to, you know, the, the, where she was saying acres and acres of open space. That is true, and it shows the trail. So you can clearly see the trail in the, so if you can see the trail, that means from the public trail, you can see the, the property anyway. Is this a direct line of sight? I've never been on that trail. Is it, in other words, it's flat or is it undulated? Have you been out there? I've been out there. Okay, I'm, I'm just asking, what's the terrain like? Is the terrain is, very, is variable. Okay. Yeah, it's so very it's variable. Flat. So parts of it, nope, you can't see anything. Other parts, you see everything. Thank you. It's remarkable. It's a beautiful area. And I can understand why you would, would want to live there. So did we, did we get the PowerPoint up to find out to, uh, how close that, uh, that trail is? My question is, did anyone from staff, how was it determined that you, that you couldn't see it from a public area? Because you certainly can. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Idukas, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking to where we wrote it down, but uh, my recollection is we looked at uh, the GIS, and it's roughly a quarter mile away uh, from the uh, enclosure uh, to the trail. And so your view from the trail would be a house, a guest house, a storage building, and then some cages uh, in, uh, made out of uh, chain link, essentially chain link. And we didn't feel that that was a substantial change in the view of this developed residential site uh, not, not from when it a well, quarter mile away. Hold up. It was, it was, at that point, it wasn't roofed. At that point, this was not enclosed with a roof. 
a roof of material that doesn't have any tensile strength and, and requires a lot of support. You can't string that along without it, you know, sagging. So there would, as soon as you put, the, put it, uh, a roof on top, uh, it changes it entirely. I agree that simply having a fence, there's a number of fences in the area. And, but as soon as you put a roof on nearly a, a third of an acre, that, that changes things in my mind. Commissioner Dukas, I would also say that the, the requirement for a roof is only a requirement of mine because of talking with the, um, with the zoo at, uh, in Santa Barbara. I see that their lion cages are roofed. There's not a requirement from the USDA or the Fish and Wildlife that they're roofed. But, the, but this, is, this is something that we're considering is a roofed structure and the, and the reason for that is to respond. I understand that you're trying to do everything to respond to people's concerns that the tigers might escape. And so we didn't have any question, we didn't have an answer of how tiger, how high they can jump and how high the fence needs to be. I recall that. We didn't get an answer to that. So, so we came up with this idea that there's going to be a roof, a, ro a roof on a structure that is a large structure. And uh, most certainly you can see it from this public trail. So how was it determined that it was not viewable just from GIS? No one actually went out there? Is that correct? Uh, I did not go out on the trail, no. Did, it, did staff go out there? Anyone from, okay. No one from staff went out there at all? Park. Yes. Uh, no, we went to the site, not to the park. Okay. All right. Um, Um, is there, I direct this to county council, is there a, a provision in CEQA case law where if you have um, conflicting expert opinion that the decision making body can, uh, you know, pick one? Or what do you do when there's conflicting expert opinion with regard to CEQA issues? That's a good question, and it depends on what the uh, the CEQA issue is. The CEQA issue before your commission is whether or not um, to approve the negative declaration. And so, I, I should to answer your question, I'll take a step back. And the the, the rule on negative declaration is that an agency may adopt the neg negative declaration only if there is no substantial evidence that a project may have a significant significant effect on the environment. And so your question goes to um, uh, the, the, sort of the, the, the existence of substantial evidence. And so if, if the, the project's opponents, I'll call them, presented substantial evidence through an expert um, that, does, um, that does meet the threshold in your mind that the project may have a significant effect on the environment, then that is, is sufficient, a sufficient basis for you not to approve the negative declaration, even if there's expert testimony that, that conflicts with that and says, no, that's not uh, a significant effect on the environment. So there, so there is solid case law that when there's conflicting, this happens all the time, and I'm very familiar with the case because it happened to be Sunshine Canyon where there were uh, conflicting expert opinions and the decision-making body went with one over the other. And uh, this decision-making body can do that if it cho chooses. Is that correct? That is correct in this context. And, and I, I guess I should, um, it, it, the, the, the analysis would be different if this was um, an environmental impact report. And in that case, when there's conflicts between expert opinions, then um, then that, that isn't a basis not to approve the EIR. But when you're talking about a negative declaration, it's different. Um, but I should also point out that expert opinion must um, consist of or be based upon substantial evidence. And so that is the, the standard that Mr. Baca addressed before. And so in order for you to rely on that expert opinion, it has to be substantial evidence, which, which has to 
have a proper foundation and um, can't be conclusory or just based on an argument. It has to have substance. Uh, understood. And I, uh, it could be argued that that we have that. Is could do you agree that it's arguable that we have that? Respectfully, that's that's not my my role to to, to go there. That, that's that's a role of your commission to decide. I believe it's arguable. Um, the um, the other question that I had, and perhaps this was for um, st uh, this way, the 12 to 15 foot um, uh, height of the enclosed structure. Um, if you had that six gauge uh, chain link, um, not chain link, but that material. Um, how often would you need to have like I beams and, and posts to keep that up? And is it, are there, do we have off the shelf standards for that in builder, building and safety? Or is that something we're making up as we go along? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Idukas, um, I would uh, have to profess that I'm uniquely unqualified to uh, answer that question. That's a building structural question that would depend on how high it's approved to be and uh, how thick the wire would be, and then a structural engineer would determine what the adequate bracing is. So I don't think we could answer that until there's actual building plans are submitted and reviewed by uh, our building officials group. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was uh, the offer to have repeater stations on the property. Uh, what kind of uh, what kind of process would the applicant have to go through that? And and is it something that would be um, that's conceivably allowed in that uh, area? Uh, Commissioner Dukas, I, I truly apologize. I was looking for something else at the moment. Could you possibly repeat your question? I'm sorry. Yes. What kind of process would the applicant have to go through if they made good on their promise to have cell phone repeater, you know, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the, on the name of the thing. Uh, it would be called a yeah. wireless communication facility, uh -huh. and they would have to get a CUP to install it. Okay, and um, so that would be a separate CUP? That's correct. Okay. One thing that concerns me is that there was reference made that this has been a five-year search and a five-year process with Ventura County. Were there um, communications made to the applicant that... Um, despite the five years that it, it was not, that does not uh, predict the approval of the CUP? That's a, it's a discretionary permit process. So as I understand it, um, Ms. Hauser probably came to the county and came to the counter with her different permits and said, you know, is this one in the open space zone? And, and, and looked at the different GIS layers through it to see what would be a good likelihood of success. But there's never any guarantee on any discretionary permit process. And um, Commissioner Dukas, I did just talk to Melinda Talent from the Environmental Health Department that did just call the Simi Valley Landfill and said that they don't have any distinction between waste, be it tiger or uh, elephants, which we have in the county, which they pick up as well, or horse manure. Okay, so that was just an error. Somebody yes. wrote that in error. Okay, thank you. How does staff respond to the information that we have that uh, that with the with regard to the insurance issue? I know I couldn't. I, I had problems with a, a trampoline. I can't imagine, you know, a, what kind of what I would need to do for a tiger. Um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Idukas, uh, I can report I had a similar trampoline problem. Uh, <laughs> And um, for which I'm still suffering. Um, and, um, but in terms of uh, liability, I believe the liability uh, for anything that happens with the Tigers rests with the operator and owner and the holder of the permit. And um, I don't think I have a, an exclusion or a provision in my homeowner's insurance for 
if my neighbor uh, allows something uh, dangerous to come into my yard. So I think uh, I think the testimony earlier that insurance cover you know, sort of natural events, and if you're doing something unusual, uh, you have to carry your insurance to cover the liability that you're incurring on your neighbors. Mr. Chair, point of order, if I may, if Mr. Guilford would like to answer that specific point, I'd like to represent but not testify. That's your typical homeowner's policy, so that if a wild animal attacked you, has nothing to do with you having a wild animal. So like in this particular situation, you're out in an area where wild animals exist, your particular homeowner's policy may not protect you from a rabbit coyote. But again, I don't want to put words in Mr. Guilford, but I think what he showed us was a typical homeowner's policy with the exceptions such as force mayor and all these other things that they can put. So following up on that, I know that for the dog-wolf hybrid, uh, he had insurance that was uh, part of the con conditions. Is that right? Um, is there something similar in this, in this application, uh, a requirement for a, a minimum amount of insurance? There is not. Uh, I'll check, being uh, not blessed with instant recall. Okay. Uh, and did we ever get the photos? We did. Okay. Excellent. And after this, I'm done. We got it. <laughs> so we're waiting for a response on the insurance. So Are we the, the, skip? The, in, the, what, what's typically in every conditional use permit is the indemnification for the county. So as I understood it, that you said that we had a special condition in the wolf dog permit that required him to have different insurance. Yes. And that's the question I'm going to call up and ask. Steph. I'm just wondering. Okay. Okay. Do we have a further, uh, an aerial further back? Um, okay, see the, uh, the thing that's marked storage? That was the house that was 1650, and in all the real estate listings state very clearly it's a house, and there are a number of pictures of the interior um, if you go on that link. It's clearly a house. It was not a barn. So is that what, is that what was on the side of the road? I have pictures also of of uh, the 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 sink. There's. Did you see the pictures that I took what, of the side of the road? No. When you see on the side of the road, you'll have to clarify that. Uh, perhaps it's the drive. It's drive to the gate. You know how it's on a flag lot. Right. Okay. It was uh, immediately uh, on. It's almost as, as soon as you get off of Pacific View, that's where the stuff has been for weeks, um, to my knowledge. Okay, right. Um, as and far as and it matches the interior view of the listings. So right. it came, it, that's where it came from. It's not, you, you can match it in the photos. That's why I printed all that out. Okay, again, I'm not aware of any uh, rubbish that would be on the road, any open storage anything like that on the property. Um, I don't recall that planning staff has ever been there within the past several weeks or even past few months. Um, when planning staff did visit the property, um, we did note that there was a, uh, it was illegally converted to a dwelling unit at one point in time. And uh, that violation has subsequently be, been uh, partially abated Again, the full abation would uh, rest with the uh, decision here of the commission. If the uh, CUP is denied, then the kitchen facilities will need to be removed from that dwelling unit. If the CUP is approved, then there is a condition of approval that will allow the kitchen facilities for the preparation of the animal diets. And that's uh, the building that is um, marked storage there? Yes, that's correct. It's uh, up in the top left, storage. Okay. But it clearly was a house, and that was the the building that was uh, 1650 square feet. And then that second dwelling is uh, the 700 square foot. And uh, if you, 
have another photo that's further back in, in, in an aerial. Okay, um, see where the, um, the like stables are? Yes. And that long drive leading to the gate, that is where the stuff has been dumped for weeks and it matches the photos of the listings of the inside of the guest house. Um, it's, uh, and you're, you're just not aware of that? That's correct. Okay. Um, at the top of the hill, out beyond uh, the Hauser's property, it looks like you're not, you don't have something a little bit wider than this? No, unfortunately, that's all we have in the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, if you go on Google Earth, you can see uh, where the trailhead is, and uh, from the trailhead, you cannot see the house. But as you go on the trail, and there is a photo from uh, Mrs. Cummins that that shows the, is it pronounced Sereno or Sereno Valley? Sereno? Um, that trail, I always mispronounced it. Um, you can you can look down. So um, at no time, no staff member went out on the trail to determine that it's that you can see it. That's correct. Um, okay. You're right in that the um, the the trail, the valley, Serrano Valley, I, I believe it's called. Yes. Um, can be seen from the uh, the subject property. However, staff did not go into the valley, the mm -hmm. national park to view the subject property. Okay. Well, I think, I think I've made my point. You can see it from the trail, and the trail connects to La Jolla, Sycamore, Backbone. It's, um, and we also have uh, uh, testimony from Channel Islands that they use the area, and uh, I believe some, some other testimony. So that's just something that I noticed in the staff report was not correct. Thank you. That is all I've got. Okay. No other questions of staff. We'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and close the uh, public hearing. We're going to take a five-minute break and come right back. Thanks. Okay. Let's reconvene the meeting. Um, we close the public uh, the public hearing portion. Um, Discussion by commissioners. Do we have something from county council? Oh yes, I just wanted to address the question about um, liability insurance that will be carried by the um, the applicant and potential permittee, and uh, they represented that they do in fact carry insurance that covers um, that would cover the tigers uh, in the event of an escape and injury of a third party with limits of uh, of a million dollars. Thank you. Okay, discussion. Uh, Commissioner Maggie. <clears throat> well, first of all, um, I'd also like to applaud the applicant. Uh, they had a good amount of due diligence in the process, without question. Uh, but what do we have? We have a wild animals are allowed uh, on the applicant's property based on the coastal uh, zoning ordinance. Okay, but there's no standards, and and I have a problem with that. Um, I mean, I've heard a lot of testimony about how far away are people from this property, and 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 how how far away should you be in order to have something like this? And that'd be a standard, uh, or the density of neighbors, uh, noise levels. Uh, I'm sure we don't, I, I don't have a definitive idea what that is yet. Um, you know, the, the minimum level of communication in case of emergency, there, there's nothing in, in the ordinance about that. Uh, I'm sure there'd be a different standard for a sanctuary versus a place of business where you transport wild animals. Um, uh, so so I'm, I'm hung up on the standards issue as, as relates to this application. Mr. Dukes. 
Um, I'd like to commend everyone for donating all this time and all this effort in, into protecting your home in this gorgeous area. I can understand why you feel so proud and protective of it. Um, I, was, I was really struck by um, its incredible beauty. Uh, absolutely a fantastic public resource, uh, the, the hiking trails in the area. Um, just to just to paint a, a picture for people who haven't who perhaps have not been there, uh, the backdrop is Mount Boney, which is extremely picturesque. But you turn around, and it's the Pacific Ocean, with rolling hills um, intervening. It's just it's just lovely. Um, there there was a lot of information that I took notes on that we read. Um, some of it was um, compelling, and some of it uh, uh, does not ha it doesn't pertain to the planning commission. So it's it might be something that's that's true, that's that's um, supported by facts, and that is a uh, very important to uh, to different people, but it's not within the the purview of the planning commission. Those issues um, had to do with, uh, uh, gosh, the, the the fear and anxiety that that people might have, um, the advisability of of uh, breeding white tigers, uh, of of what it takes to get a white tiger. Um, that's that's not something that that we have any um, control over. So we just have to accept what is. Um, we have conflicting evidence about, uh, about CEQA impacts. And um, I think that, uh, I think we also have, uh, there were two areas. One had to do with the biological resources and whether or not, you know, it, Procedures were followed to make sure that these uh, tigers wouldn't have an impact on the on the wildlife. I certainly know that there's a lot of wildlife there, um, and then we have the noise issue. But going to the things that so so those things I in in my decision making process I go through like a, a series of like sieves, you know, and there's certain things that just I I filter out because they're not hours to to wrestle with but certain things are and uh, the uh, there were some things that were brought up that just were factually incorrect and I had a real problem getting straight answers on something just as simple as is that a barn or is that a house Clearly, the photos show that it was a house, and I felt that um, your your answers were not forthcoming, and uh, uh, that that that's uh, something that really uh, sets me off. I felt that um, the the photograph the photographs at home uh, showed. Uh, Supported credence to safety protocols, uh, just just not being adhered to in a way that uh, made me feel any level of security or comfort. Um, the notion that you have more risk uh, driving on PCH than you do from these tigers, people people assume a certain amount of risk in their life, and they accept that risk. They accept the risk every time they get in the car. Or if they live in an area where there are mountain lions, coyotes, rattlesnakes, etc., but those risks are there already. This is an introduced risk, which in my mind is completely different than something that's already there that people have already made that judgment and people accept. Um, I find that this. We, we did something else where uh, we, we had a very long hearing. We had uh, people out on both sides of in, uh, having to do with the, uh, the dog-wolf hybrid facility. In my mind, 
there is no question that these are not, you know, tiger hybrids. They're, they're not in any way, uh, there's no DNA strain of, of a domesticated animal. So to me, that's very distinct. Uh, one, uh, the, the wolf-dog hybrids, there was a mistake made that they even needed to come to the Planning Commission because it was considered a kennel because they were dogs and not uh, wolves. That uh, is another difference in my mind from those inherently dangerous animals is what our zoning ordinance calls it for the non-coastal area. And this coastal zoning ordinance, this is all what we're going on, uh, with wild animals. One thing that really caught my attention was that uh, wild animals and then nothing further. All we have is a little box and an X saying with the CUP you can have them and what they're defined as is animals which are wild by nature and not customarily domesticated in Ventura County. What a lousy definition of a wild animal. Because I thought somebody made a very compelling argument um, speaking to these are exotics and when the applicant spoke she talked about exotics a wild animal is something quite different than an exotic animal which is another reason why I think that our standards here are just absolutely lacking it's I don't want to back into a situation where we are approving animal enclosures and you are doing everything in your power to accommodate the, the legitimate concerns of people with the safety and the, the making it as safe as possible where the tigers cannot escape. However, we don't have the expertise and I am not comfortable. We are not biologists. We have no uh, business making uh, approvals on the fly for a, a structure that may or may not even be structurally sound. I don't know what kind of tensile strength that those, uh, that gauge wire has and what kind of uh, post and beam construction you have to have in order to have a truck to get in underneath it. I just think that it's uh, nonsense that this is something that we're making up as we're going along. And I think it's very ill-advised. So, um, I felt that the fire danger was too extreme and the two main roads, Deer Creek, I think there is no way I would want any kind of truck to, to, uh, to use Deer Creek to go down, to, uh, to leave the property. Because when I went there the first time, uh, my, my brakes overheated and uh, uh, it was a brand new, it's a one-year-old car. Uh, going the other way on Yerba Buena seems uh, a lot more reasonable. But the, the terrain is uh, ex it's extremely mountainous in contrast to the facilities where uh, in Lockwood Valley. Completely different. And you cannot uh, compare the fire danger in that Santa Monica Mountains, all you have to do is go there and see the devastation of the most recent fire and the riotous growth since the Green Meadow fire in 20 years ago. It's, uh, it's dramatic and there is no comparison between the two areas and I think that smiling and laughing when people are talking about fire safety showed very poor comportment on, on the part of the supporters of the applicant. Um, and so for those reasons, I cannot support it as, as it's proposed right now. I think that in a separate action, we can uh, uh, go to the Board of Supervisors and say, can you come up with uh, standards that, that deal with uh, wild animals, give uh, better clarification about what that actually means and what their needs are. And, uh, but what we have before us right now and, and you know, all of the attempts to make it palatable to the neighborhood to, to, uh, to make sure that the tigers don't escape just add to the problems to have a 
third of an acre structure with glinting metal roof, it, it just uh, would uh, have a great visual impact, one that has not been analyzed. So that's all I have to say about it at this point. Commissioner Onstott. Well, I've sat up here for a couple of years, and this is a first for me. I've got a staff report that goes 180 one way and a recommendation that goes the other way. And I, I have trouble reconciling it until I thought it through. The applicant has met every test. The environmental report came back, negative declaration. The use is permitted in the zone. There's no evidence to deny the CUP of a substantive nature. I don't think there's any really serious factual disputes that would stop me from voting for the applicant. And the reason for that is a perfect safety record, people on site, no public access. I look at the conditions that are imposed, and staff has come up with standards that don't exist in the code. That's what exactly what they've done. And I feel sorry for the staff, and I understand why they went through and jumped through all these hoops, having received no direction. And no matter what comes out of here today, this whole thing should go back to the Board of Supervisors for further study so that guidelines can be set. But I feel that the restrictive conditions imposed by staff would probably be stronger than anything that would have ever come out of the Board of Supervisors. A two-year permit. If you think about it, they'll be back in front of us in two years. If there are any real problems, existence out there, they will have been discovered, thought through, dealt with. Or if there's a significant problem out there during the two-year period, this sound situation is as the residents in the area think it might be, then they can come back in also. Uh, there's just too much. In, there is no credible, as far as I'm concerned, expert testimony upon which I can deny a CUP based on sound. And sound was one of the chief concerns that I had. I live between Santa Paul and Fillmore. Uh, Rancho Sespe had a film permit up there once, and they had lions. I live a mile and a half away, and I thought they were next door. So, I mean, I'm, I'm quite sensitive, but I, we don't have substantive evidence, expert evidence, upon which to deny the permit based on noise. I mean, that may happen, it may develop, but it doesn't exist now. Staff's position was denied based on public safety and compatibility. Well, I didn't see any evidentiary, sub substantive evidentiary support to deny it on a public safety basis. As I said, the conditions exceed all standards. The safety records is perfect. On the compatibility issue, I can't draw any serious distinction between this one and Lockwood Valley. And I don't think we should have two standards, as the gentleman said, one for Malibu and one for Lockwood Valley. I mean, I'm not saying there isn't a lot of work that may need to be done on the, quote, wild animals, but as, as everything exists today, as a, the record appears before me, I feel I have no choice but to vote and approve the, uh, the CUP. I mean, tigers, that's what this is all about. Everybody's scared to death. Who wants a tiger next door? I can understand and appreciate that, but it's actually permitted. All the conditions have been met and exceeded. So what are we supposed to do up here? Invent a problem to, uh, so that they can't go forward because we haven't done our job? I don't think so. I think what has to happen is that we need to do our job. The matter needs to be referred back to the policymakers to clarify this issue. But I'm not prepared to stop the application because we haven't got direction from the policymakers. So, as I said, all the conditions have been met. We have a negative declaration. I can't find a public safety or a compatibility issue. And I'm prepared to vote to approve the application. Commissioner Wessner. I concur with a lot of the information from my three colleagues, <clears throat> and I've wrestled with this one just like we did with Lockwood. Um, so, th so you understand the sieves that I use to go through the process. Property only requires a property. 
That property is subject to the zoning and terms and conditions which the property has at the time that they acquired it. Part of that is that they are in open space and they're permitted to have wild animals. And therefore, then our standards stop. So, first sieve they met. Second sieve, they comply for a conditional use permit, which is their right under our codes. And that conditional use permit, the staff analyzes for does it meet certain criteria and certain elements which they have laid out on their staff report. Then we receive testimony, both for and against. Day and a half now. Almost a thousand pages, several hours. Yes, we're not the experts in biology. We're not the experts in a lot of things, but that's the reason we exist. We have experts. We have public testimony. We're the ones to make the decision. All right? And so what we're relied on is to be this average citizen and reacting to it. Yes, we all bring our own expertise, our backgrounds, whether it's waste management, uh, security. But at the same time, the buck stops here. Now, sadly, I agree, the Board of Supervisors only give them 75 cents for the buck. So, uh, and that's what we get paid to do. Uh, it's a little joke on my part, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> And so it's not an easy decision. I agree with the, the commissioner. I would not want it next door to me. But at the same time, I'm not out in open space. Uh, Lockwood Valley, to me, set the precedent. Here are the standards. We applied the standards. The property owner has a right to expect those standards. And if they come to a conditional use permit, is there a reasonable expectation those standards can be met? Best management practices, qualifications of state and federal requirements as far as these particular animals, uh, the track records, the history that the uh, applicant has demonstrated, uh, all the information, and we weigh it, we sit it. And it comes down to, do we want a pack of wolves or do we want two to five lions? I mean tigers, I'm sorry. So the question then gets to the point, is there truly a question of public safety that staff is rep represented in the capacity question? Is there enough evidence, information, to sway my decision one way or the other? And I go back to not only what the applicant's attorney represented, but what my fellow commissioner said. We've evaluated wild animals being contained and applied standards and best practices. Um, so I'm, I'm really 5149 here, but if I'm going to go with the situation through the sieves that I've gone through, is uh, I would have to approve the CUP based on the current standards and situations that exist before this body today. Well, we all obviously all uh, have gone through a lot uh, during the last uh, two days. Uh, we've probably uh, gone through approximately 1,500 pages worth of documents uh, in addition to what we have here in front of us today. Um, it's a tough process, and I appreciate staff's, staff's predicament. I appreciate the work they put into it. I appreciate the response back on issues that came up uh, during after the uh, February 13th hearing uh, to be able to bring us back information as related to those comments and those reports. Um, and I have, you know, I have, I have, uh, I have issues. I, I, uh, I've been up there. Uh, it's been a while, but uh, I've been up there, um, and I've driven that road up there. Um, I'm reasonably familiar with what's up there. Um, I've driven it both daytime and reluctantly at night on a response to a call for service with the Sheriff's Department. Um, and I, I, I spoke in jest, but it was very true. If we went south of Magoo Rock on PCH, you were out of radio communication uh, for the length of time you were down there. Uh, over the years, it appro improved tremendously. Um, certainly, cell phones have given us a great, uh, a great link to stay con connected. But as we've heard and we all know, if you traverse that area or live in that area, um, cell phone coverage can be spotty. Um, I have a lot. I have. I had a lot of questions. Uh, uh, I th think I asked most of them, but. But the questions I, th I, I asked tended, I felt, had to do with the issue of compatibility and, and, 
and how this operation, this uh, proposal would uh, would fit into that uh, that zoning and that environment up there. I obviously had some concerns about uh, about that and the the issue of public safety, uh, and that comes to mind immediately because of the issue of the fact it's tigers, they're wild animals, they're exotic animals. Um, and in processing that, I remembered an incident uh, that I had, a uh, very real incident that I had um, when I was employed as law enforcement officer um, in a response to a call in the Newberry Park area long before it was developed to the length it is now. And that call uh, was from neighbors in a neighborhood uh, reporting a black panther. Um, in the area and at that time we had to respond there was no response from animal control uh, or fish and game um, we responded and so I spoke to my partner and I spoke to residents uh, they were very concerned uh, there were children in the area it was daytime um, and they told us what they'd seen and pointed us to a field directly across the street adjacent to these these houses and being young and naive we decided to see what it, that was all about and spread out about 20 30 feet apart uh, started walking in the general direction uh, of this uh, reported sighting uh, he with a revolver and I with a 12 gauge shotgun and we, we walked in about 50 feet maybe and all of a sudden out in front of us 25 feet, 25 yards in front of us this black cat springs up five feet into the air and just dashes um, obviously uh, it got our attention uh, we managed to get off a shot but with 12 gauge buck at that distance I'm sure we didn't hit it we, it did leave but I say that because I've experienced that uh, not as a resident, but as a responder, and I encountered the concern and fear residents had in that circumstance. I assume we, I assume that was probably a cat that, that escaped from uh, probably a cougar, black cougar that escaped from uh, the old um, jungle land that used to be in Thousand Oaks. It's long since closed. It would have been about that that time. But it's it's a very real experience I had, and so that's you know so I can I can re understand some of the concerns here. Um, I, could, I could go on and on with a number of other things to talk about, but I don't think I need to belabor all those issues anymore. Most of us have spoken about them. Um, from I was wasn't here when the uh, the uh, Lockwood Valley was uh, was before this commission. I was out of town couldn't attend so I'm not privy to that information um, all I'm all I have is the comments and the decision of the board here um, but where I sit right now uh, I'm not prepared to approve the CUP so um, we need a motion and I would just move to um, move the staff's recommended actions to deny the CUP I think it's on page let me see if I can get it. 22 or 24. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the uh, page 22 of 24, the staff's recommended actions under G. Uh, move that, those recommendations. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we'll go ahead and vote. Tell them they can appeal. Okay, uh, we're not getting it on our, on our screens if you're wondering what the delay is about. Um, so I'll go ahead and take a uh, voice vote on this. Uh, Commissioner uh, Maggie. 
Uh, my vote is to deny the uh, CUP. So on the motion, it would be yes? Yes. Okay, I vote, I vote aye. Commissioner Wessner? No. Commissioner Austin? No. And I vote uh, aye, deny the CUP. I, it, my, rec my understanding recollection is you, the applicant has time to appeal the process. Is it 10 days to appeal the decision if they choose to do that to the Board of Supervisors? Um, with that, uh, we still have business to conduct. Uh, so those of you that are going to leave, and I, okay, we'll take five minutes, and then we'll come back and conclude our um, six uh, comments by uh, Director. The um, only thing that I had for you that I was going to go over our next couple of um, hearings. So we have two items on the 17th, April the 17th, and that. What about the third? So yeah, April 3rd. We have, I was just trying to trying to gauge the time by looking at the by looking at them. So um, April 3rd. Yes, we have two items. April 17th. I think you can expect a crowd. What do we got? You have a. Well, um, the beach. Uh, no, you have a, 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 a wedding facility continuation permit. Is that, is that Muscle Shoals? No, it's for Tropical Paradise out in the um, Santa Rosa Valley. Both of them are on the 17th. Yeah, that one's on the 17th, right. And the other one, the, the Cranston Appeal. But, you know, I don't think you're going to receive. Well, I don't know. But I would just say April 17th, plan on a longer day yes a lot of public testimony for that um that's all i have i'll, I'll take um you know what what you've done today here I'm in front of the board and ask them for what they think about standards so and i'll report back to you um as soon as i hear something so okay. that's all i have do you have anything that you'd like for me but i got a question you know <clears throat> when i think of wild animals i don't think of exotic tigers i think of mountain lions and coyotes so maybe we could have some definitions in that request right and i would say to the to the defense of the uh, local coastal plan it probably was last updated with any sort of regularity back in 1986 so we've lost you know the positions to keep um, those updated so we you know we have gotten a, a rather large grant and we are working on a local coastal plan update this isn't part of it but if the board directs us to be part of it then we'll we'll search for some funds to get that done yeah i saw that and i looked through and, and that wasn't on there and I it wasn't she was yeah because it wasn't an issue yeah at the time at the time we scoped it out and got grant funding it wasn't an issue <laughs> funny how issues fly around two things do teenagers qualify as exotic or wild animals i don't have any teenagers yet <laughs> okay okay we, do we have still have four at home, go home now. no <laughs> i still have four i still have four children muscle top booby thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay let's adjourn the meeting good idea until next see ya until next time